Good evening, everybody. Could we come to order, please? And join me in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Could we have a sunshine announcement, please, Cam? Good evening, Chairman. Uh, today is Tuesday, February 20th in the year 2024. This is a Jersey City Planning Board meeting with a scheduled 5.30 p.m. start time. And in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, notice of this meeting has been given to the editor of the Jersey Journal, the Jersey City Reporter, and posted with the city clerk on February 15th, and then re-sunshined on February 16th of this year. This meeting was also posted on the Jersey City Division of City Planning webpage and all distribution materials made available to the board were published and made available to the public. Thank you. Could we have roll call, please? Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Dr. Gonzalez. Here. Commissioner Dr. Desai. Commissioner David Cruz. Here. Commissioner Stamato. Here. Commissioner uh, Vidya. Here. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Um And uh, Commissioner Torres. Yeah. All right, thanks. And Chairman Langston. Here. All right, we have seven commissioners present. We have a quorum. All right, could we swear in the staff, please, Mike? Yes. All right, thank you. Cam, do we have any correspondence? None, Chairman. Okay, do you want to read down the adjournments, or do we want to just get into uh, the meat and potatoes here? <laughs> we can do it. It would take, take probably uh, five to bit. ten minutes. Okay. You, let's sure. do it. All right. So uh, we do have quite a lot of adjournments. Um, they are under uh, item <coughs> six of the agenda, um, and we will start with adjourn uh, adjournment item A, and we will work our way to J, A to J. Um, so that is A, case P22-189. It's for a preliminary and final major site plan with variances. Address is 216 Palisades Avenue. Um, this is actually a good one that we've made an announcement to because um, this is being carried to February 27th which is a special meeting of this year. So that's next week on Tuesday. Um, so it's a, it's a good announcement to make, yeah. And it's listed on the agenda, but um, that is to be carried to February 27th, 2024, special meeting. And there will be new notice. Um, no notice is carried, of course. So item B uh, under adjournments is case P23-075. That's a preliminary and final major site plan with C variances. Address is 319 to 321 4th Street. That is carried to March 5th with preservation of notice. Uh, item C, case P2023-0023, preliminary and final major site plan. Address is 30 and 40 Newport Parkway. Um, this is carried to March 5th of this year with preservation of notice. Item D, case P22-227, for a preliminary and final major site plan with variances. Address is 605 to 607 Grove Street. Um, this is being carried to March 5th of this year with preservation of notice. Item E, uh, that's case P2023-0044, a preliminary and final major site plan. Address is 35 Fairview Avenue, and that is being carried to March 5th of 2024 uh, with preservation of notice. Item F, uh, that is case P2023-0074. It is a site plan amendment for address 239 to 259 Cole Street, and that is being carried to March 5th of this year with preservation of notice. Item G on the agenda, this is case P20, uh, P23-032. This is a preliminary and final major site plan with a conditional use and C variances. That's probably the longest title that you could get. Hmm. Um, that is address 791 to 805 Westside Avenue, and that is being carried to March 19th meeting of this year with preservation of notice. Um, item H um, is case P2023-0053, uh, uh, a preliminary and final major site plan uh, for an interim use. 
Address is 675 to 695 Grand Street, and um, they have requested to carry with preservation of notice to March 19th of this year. Item I, um, under adjournments, it's case P2023-0082. That is for a preliminary and final major site plan. Address is 681 to 685 Newark Avenue. And um, they have carried to March 19th of this year with preservation of notice. And last but not least, J, case P22-187, a preliminary and final major site plan with variances. Address is 191 to 193 Academy Street. And they have requested to carry with preservation of notice to March 19th of this year. And that uh, is all of the adjournments, Chairman. Okay, thanks, Cam. So let's get into new business. We'll call item eight is case P23-099. It's a site plan amendment for 17 to 23 Perrine Ave. Good evening, Commissioners. Tom Lean from Connell Foley on behalf of the applicant. Uh, the application before you this evening is a notice case. I did provide an electronic version of the affidavit uh, to uh, planning. Uh, I do have a newspaper copy, an affidavit from the newspaper. I appear to be missing my mailings. Uh, we re-noticed for this once we went back in person. I believe they might actually be in my car. So if I could proceed with the presentation and provide them to uh, council uh, after my presentation, it would be greatly appreciated. So, Council, why don't you give me the affidavit of publication? I did have the opportunity, Chairman, and to review the affidavit of publication since the mailing that was provided electronically to me and it appeared to be in order. We're going to mark it as A1 for purposes of the record. And then obviously, Council. The mic's not on. <coughs> Mike. So I had the opportunity to review the proof of publication affidavit of mailing electronically. Uh, so, Chairman, we can mark them as A1 for purposes of the record. I have the affidavit of publication, the original here in my possession, and based on counsel's representation that those proof of mailings are uh, in his possession. He'll deliver them to the board so we can mark those as A1 for the record and proceed. Thank you, counsel. Thank you, counsel. Uh, the application before you this evening uh, is an amendment for a project that was approved by this board several years ago. Uh, it was amended and extended uh, several times. Uh, it is currently a valid approval. One of the reasons for the extension was uh, that the uh, Journal Square Redevelopment Plan has been amended and this area was uh, changed to Zone 4A. It was approved as Zone 4. Uh, that The major difference being that the heights under Zone 4 were six stories. This building was approved at six stories. The amendment before you today does not change that height in any way. The amendments before you today change the uh, approval of 48 units uh, to 57 units. Um, that does not trigger this being a new application. Uh, there are also changes to the uh, setbacks to the previously approved building, as well as the removal of the previously approved basement and an expansion of the green roof and recreational roof. Uh, I have two witnesses uh, this evening. Jeffrey Lewis is my architect, and he will be my first stop. All right. Thank you, Council. <clears throat> yes, I do. Jeffrey Lewis, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-L-E-W-I-S. Mr. Lewis, good evening. We've qualified you in the past. Uh, your license is current tonight? It is current and in good standing, yes. Okay. Thank you. You're qualified. Thank you. Are we going to be able to get this up, or...? Mr. Lewis, if you're going to be sharing any slides that were not included in the submission to the board, obviously those we will mark if they're all in one slideshow. No, this uh, we is, can mark um, it as an entire package. I believe Mr. Lewis is just going to walk through the plans as uh, submitted. Thank uh, you. And Mr. Lewis, before you start, uh, you did not prepare the plans that are before the board this evening. That's correct. But as a licensed architect in the state of New Jersey, you've reviewed them and are familiar with them. Yes.
I'm sorry, it's mm. my screen's a little silly right now. Okay. So, 17-23 Paranav, as uh, mentioned, is a previously approved six-story uh, building. Uh, I'm just going to focus on the revisions here, uh, most notably uh, the unit count, which has been revised from 48 units to 57. <coughs> this includes a reduction of the one-bedroom units from 37 down to 20, and then an increase of all of the rest of the units. So studios have gone up from 5 to 18. One bedrooms with an extra dense space went up from 1 to 5. The two bedrooms went from 5 to 9. The two bedrooms with a den, we previously had none, now we have three. And we previously had no three bedrooms, and now we have two of those. Uh, looking at the plans, we have the previously approved on the left and then uh, the proposed on the right. Um, first, on the top left here, you can see the building previously had a cellar. This was used for tenant and bike storage. We are removing uh, the cellar space and relocating these spaces above. Um, moving on to the ground floor plan, I want to go over to the right where the new plan is shown. Um, uh, Mr. Lewis, just give us one second. We're sure. trying to. Oh, sorry. Get these up on the All screen. Right, we got it. Hit, uh, you. No, view large display. We're good over here. <laughs> yes. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, great. Okay. So let's go back to where I was at the first floor plan. I want to start with the bulk of the building, um, where at the front of the building, we did decrease the front yard setback down to three feet. Uh, along the right side of the building, we previously had a three-foot alley, and we've removed that alley, and now we're building up to the property line on the right side. Uh, on the left side of the building, we did keep the alley along the back and uh, along the side of the building and along the back of the building, excuse me. Uh, however, we did make some changes to the back of the building here where we have um, these two one-story add-ons that extend out to the rear property line and create some enclosed uh, private yards for the tenants on the first floor. Um, moving inside the building, uh, on the front left of the building here, we have our main, bo uh, main lobby, which remains in the same location. Uh, there are two stairs, and however, uh, we previously had one elevator. We added a second elevator, so there are two elevators in the building now. Uh, on the back left here, we have our trash compactor room. It's fed from a chute from above, and it can be accessed both from the lobby and has direct access out to the side yard as well. Um, next to that, we have our bicycle storage room. Uh, this bicycle this storage room has been uh, sized for 57 bicycles, and again, you can get there directly from the lobby or directly to the outside to access uh, the street. Uh, down at the end of the hall, we have our fire sprinkler room, as this is a fully sprinklered building. Um, and then besides this, we have seven apartments on this floor. Um, the, the apartments in the building are color-coded. Uh, the blue apartments are studios. The light gray apartments are one-bedroom apartments. The green apartments are two-bedroom apartments. And dark gray, which you can't see here, are our three-bedroom apartments. So there are seven on this floor, and the four in the rear of the building each have their own private yard in the back. I'm going to move to the second floor. Um, this uh, floor has 10 total apartments, and again, four of them have private roof decks that are located on top of those one-story uh, building additions at the ground floor. Uh, also to note here is at the end of the hall, there is that trash and recycling room with a chute that goes down directly to the uh, compactor. This is the third and fourth floor. Um, this is actually the same as the second floor, with the exception of the roof decks being removed at the back. So these four apartments back here will not have roof decks. And I'm going to move on to the fifth and sixth floor in a second, but I just want to note it's pretty much the same as this floor, except for these two units at the bottom right corner, where right now we have a one-bedroom and a two-bedroom. And if you look at the next sheet, those colors change, and now we have a studio, and this is where our three-bedroom apartments are on the fifth and sixth floor. The building uh, still has rooftop amenities and a rooftop deck. Um, what we have is, is served by both stairs and both elevators. There are a few closets, uh, two ADA bathrooms, a fitness center, and a lounge area. Uh, the interior space is slightly increased from what was previously approved. Uh, the exterior uh, roof deck area is 1,336 square feet, and this is actually decreased from what was previously approved. And then the green roof area, both on this roof and on the roof of the amenity space, 
uh, total is 4,540 square feet, which is also increased from what was previously approved. Looking at the building elevations, the top elevation is what was previously approved, and the bottom elevation is what we are proposing. So the previously approved building was four stories of red brick, and then the top two floors were a dark gray fiber cement panel. We're proposing a almost entirely brick building. Uh, so the ground floor with two different colors. So the ground floor brick, brick will be uh, this black diamond velour shown here on the left. Uh, we're using two different patterns. Uh, we have these vertical piers in between the window bays, which will have a standard brick pattern. Then in the window bays themselves, we're using a sawtooth pattern. Uh, there's a, a soldier course separating the first floor from above, and then the five floors above are going to be a, a smooth red brick. Um, that continues up to the cornice, where we actually have a built-up brick cornice. So as I said, it's an almost entirely brick building. Um, going up from there, you can see beyond that rooftop amenity space, which you won't see from the street. Uh, but that's going to be finished with a white um, aluminum panels. Going back to the building finishes, we have uh, black aluminum entry doors, uh, black framed aluminum windows. There's a black aluminum canopy located above the main uh, lobby entrance. Uh, we also have aluminum grills for our HVAC system. They will be painted. You can see them here, here, and then a third row of them here. Uh, these will be painted the same color as the brick. Uh, pr the previous approval actually had PTACs. Uh, so where a PTAC has one uh, grill for every room, this actually only has one grill for each apartment. So we're reducing the number of grills overall. Um, so we think that's a better system. Here's the rear elevation. Um, again, previously approved above, our new approved at the our new at the bottom, where we are proposing just a white fiber cement siding finish. And again, you can see the um, the new grills for our HVAC system, which would be just painted white to match the exist the new siding. And then lastly, we have the side elevations. Again, the approved are on the left, and now the proposed are here on the right. So what you can see is we are wrapping the front finishes, the two brick finishes, around both sides back to where the stair towers are. And then from the stair towers, the rest of the way to the back of the building will be the white um, fiber cement siding to match the rear finishes. Um, that actually concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time. We uh, do have the site plan. Uh, just one question, uh, Mr. Lewis. Um, you are not a license <laughs> planner, however, <laughs> these changes they are designed to comply with the bulk standards within the Journal Square 2060 redevelopment plan, correct? Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Uh, next up, I have uh, Brian Zwarwich, who is my uh, civil engineer. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Lewis? No. Just make sure your mic's on, Eddie. Witness going to speak on the uh, front yard setback? Um, in terms oh, of compliance or in terms of... Uh, you have a family for... Am I looking at this correctly? That's right there. No. No, there's no variance. There's no variance. Council. Front yard setback. Reduction in the front yard setback. It's, uh, That's right. It was The building was previously set back, I think, about 8 to 10 feet, and now we're reducing that to 3 feet. We've reduced the front yard setback from 10 feet or so to three feet, but it still meets the requirements. It's still not a variance. Okay, so you, you there is a change there. Yes. That's what I was trying yes, to get Yes, there's a change, but it still complies with the zone. I missed that part, okay. So it went how many more feet? It's gone to three feet. I think it was right around 10 feet uh, previously. I don't have the exact. Council, perhaps we should talk about what was required, what was granted. I'm sorry. Sure. I and then what it is. Uh, Mr. Lewis, uh, if you can go back to uh, the yeah. initial site plan. All right, um, this isn't working how I thought it was gonna work, I'm sorry. How do I get those back up? Can you see what that says? I'm too old for this. <laughs> yeah, it is, right? Thank you. I just can't see which is which, so I'll guess. That's not the one I wanted. That's not the one I wanted. Oh, Jesus. 
Here we go. I'm sorry, I can only see it there. I can't see it here. It's a little weird. And it's also a little slow. Really? It's not on that monitor? Yeah, it's the way this is working. I thought I switched it so it would mirror this, but it's not. That's extending awesome. Extending it. So here you can see uh, the approved on the left and the proposed here on the right. Uh, I can zoom in a little more and give you a closer number. So what's the consistency with that uh, setback now with the rest of the neighborhood? So, um, the buildings, I believe, to our left. Uh, my nothing, my concern more is do we still have enough do we have more sidewalk space still than compared to the rest of the houses that are on the block, or are we even with the same sidewalk space as the rest of the houses on the block? We have, we have the same sidewalk width as the rest of the block. We're not taking away any sidewalk width. Okay. The sidewalk width remains unchanged, and it's the same as the rest of the, the block. But with the setback before, you were giving us more space, actually. Yeah, the setback had, had um, bicycle parking in it. You can see we had a bunch of bicycle parking in the center. And then we just had a planting area where now we just have a planting strip. So there's less, there's basically less, less planting overall. Okay, <clears throat> that's good enough. To... It, well, while not testifying here, I can say that the the redevelopment plan requires that you comply with the predominant setback on the block. I I only it, brought it up because you have it as a variance on the. Well, no, it's, it's just it's, that's, it's that's just why one of the changes. It's it, not it, a variance, but it's just listed as one of the things we've changed. There are no variances. Description of all the, the changes that you're making. Okay. Yeah, that oh, yeah. there are no. That's why I'm bringing this up. It was, yeah. uh, that was my concern. All right, thank you. So, council, for the record. There was no variance for a front yard setback originally, and there is no variance sought as a result of the proposed change for a front yard setback. That is correct. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lewis, I do have a question about the aluminum panels on the rooftop sure. in the amenity <clears throat> space. Uh, they're white aluminum. Yes. Is it a, a matte finish that won't produce a glare? Yeah, that would be the plan to make it definitely we can agree to a matte finish. We want it to be kind of... Inobtrusive. Yeah, I mean, white is a glare producer as right. far as yeah. I'm concerned. Exactly. So. We're trying to blend, so a, a matte finish would be great. Okay. Okay, that's it for me. Anybody else? Yeah. Not really. Okay. Sorry, you can only see there. <laughs> uh, and with that, uh, I have my civil engineer, Brian Svarich. <clears throat> yes. My name is uh, Brian Zwarge. That's B R I A N Z W A R Y C as in Charlie, Z as in zebra. Thank you. Sure. And uh, Mr. Zwarge, I don't think you have testified in front of this board before. Would you please mind giving them the benefit of your education and background, as well as providing the board uh, with your licensure and letting them know it's current? Sure. I've testified virtually in front of this board, but I'm a <laughs> licensed professional engineer in the state of uh, New Jersey since 2016, and I have a Bachelor of Science degree in civil engineering from uh, Rutgers University. Okay. And that license is current tonight? It's current, yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're qualified. Uh, so on uh, display right now is uh, sheet number 5 of 12 from our site plan. It's the gradage, grading drainage and utility plan, which was submitted to the board, uh, dated August 25th, 2022, revised through uh, October 23rd, 2023. North is generally uh, to the right where the county building and parking garage exist. Parina Avenue is along the bottom of the sheet. Uh, High Street is uh, off to the left, and, and Summit Avenue's uh, off to the top of the sheet. Uh, the site's known as Block 10803, uh, lots 2, 3, and 4, and it's located on the westerly side of Perrine Avenue. The street address is uh, 17 to 23 Perrine Avenue. It's a generally uh, rectangular parcel containing approximately 0.2 acres, and it's located within Zone 4A of the Journal Square 20. 60 redevelopment plan area at the time of the previous <coughs> approval uh, it was in zone four as uh, is reflected on our uh, zone table uh, Brian Avenue is a dead-end street uh, dead ends just north of the site 
and it allows for two-way traffic with parking uh, on the east side. The surrounding area is a, a mix of uses, uh, including residential uh, and commercial. Pleasure. The site is currently vacant, or it was previously developed with uh, residential uses. The site is primarily pervious at this time and generally slopes from the northerly corner southeasterly toward uh, Perrine. Uh, and access was previously provided to the residential uses via uh, driveways. Uh, Building layout changes were addressed by our architects, so my testimony will focus on the stormwater management, utility, lighting, and landscaping modifications. Uh, this, for stormwater management, the uh, previous design proposed 1,403 square feet of green roof area and an underground detention system between the front of the building and the right-of-way line, and it discharged to the existing combined store on Perrine <laughs> Avenue. The proposed system includes about 4,500 square feet of green roof area and an underground detention tank located in the westerly corner of the building uh, under the uh, trash compactor room and uh, bike storage room. And it uh, discharges to the existing combined store on Perrine Avenue. The new uh, green roof on the project is uh, greater than three times the size of the previously proposed green roof for utilities. Uh, water, sewer, gas, electric, and telecommunications. All new services out to Perrine Avenue were previously proposed and are proposed for the new building. Locations uh, of those utility services have been adjusted to reflect the proposed interior layout uh, in coordination with the uh, building design team. Uh, I'm gonna go to the next uh, sheet here. That's the, uh, oh, I just have to use it down here. Okay. This uh, is sheet number six of 12 uh, from our site plans, the landscape and lighting plan, uh, which was submitted to the board. This uh, sheet's uh, dated August 25th, 2022, and revised uh, through October 23rd, 2023. Uh, as compared to the uh, 2021 uh, previously approved architectural plans with in regards to uh, street trees, four were, street trees were uh, previously uh, proposed and approved, and four uh, street trees are proposed. Uh, Jersey City Forestry standards require one tree for every 25 feet of frontage, which uh, in this case would be six trees. Uh, the applicant will uh, make a monetary contribution in lieu of installing the two uh, additional trees. Uh, for lighting, the previous design utilized building mounted fixtures. The new design proposes two decorative fixtures along the curve line. And the, uh, the project itself is uh, fully compliant with the journal square 2060 redevelopment plan with no uh, deviations. Mr. Zwarich, you've uh, received uh, the memo from uh, City Engineering and the memo from uh, Traffic dated November 27th, 2023. You've reviewed those, and uh, we can comply with uh, the re uh, requested conditions therein? That's correct. We'll address the comments in those uh, letters. I have nothing further for Mr. Zwarich. Okay. Thank you. Anybody? Any questions? No. No. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, that is our presentation. Uh, I do have Mr. Lee Klein here. We did submit a traffic report as required. There are no on-site parking spaces on this project. So unless the board has any questions, uh, I have no further testimony. Okay, thank you. Anybody have questions on uh, the traffic report? Okay, thank you, Council. Thank you. So at this time, let's open it up for public comment. If anybody's here from the public that wants to comment on this application, please come on up. Anybody from public? Mr. Chair, seeing no public, I move to close the public portion. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded. Public is closed. Uh, Cam, are you handling this? Yeah, so I'm stepping in for Mr. De Silva on this application for staff comments, and um, I'm going to ask that Mr. Lean uh, confirm whether he's reviewed the staff memo dated uh, November, actually, November 8th of 2023. Uh, I have, and all conditions within are acceptable. Okay. Um, and in addition to putting on the record that they agree to the staff recommending conditions, staff would just reiterate that there are no variances or deviations, and this does comply with the 
objectives and goals of the General Square 2060 Redevelopment Plan, and planning staff recommends approval. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, case P23-099 as presented to the board tonight. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded for approval. Vice Chair, Dr. Gonzalez. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Gungadin. Aye. Commissioner Torres. I just want to make a statement that um, this this project has come to this board many a times, many a changes, and um, the, the project has been approved by the board. Um, it's a project I was never a fan of and always opposed, but that's not what we're here for. The changes that they make to me are not that significant, and um, but I did take a stand that I never did agree on this project in that area. Um, but with that, the project did get approved by the board, and with that, I vote aye for the changes that it want to be made. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Dr. Desai? Aye. Commissioner Cruz? Aye. Commissioner Stamato? Aye. And Chairman Langston? Aye. Motion carries all in favor with conditions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to item nine. Is case P2023-0069. It's a preliminary and final major site plan amendment. For 180 10th Street, 543.5 Manila Ave, and 545 Manila Ave. Council, do you want to call the next case concurrently? Yes, please. I was going to ask that. Okay, so we'll also call item 10, uh, case P2023-0070. is a preliminary and final major site plan amendment for 204 10th Street, 543.5 Manila Ave., and 545 Manila Ave. And Council, uh, just for uh, the record, we'll be voting separately on these applications. We'll hear the presentation together, but we'll have two separate votes. Yes, that's okay. fine. Thank you. So, uh, for the record, my name is James McCann from the law firm of Connell Foley in Jersey City. I'm here on uh, case 069 and 070. Um, I'm going to present the first case 070 first because it is really the case that has the plans that are involved and then I will explain to you case 069 second. Um, this is a notice case council so I guess we should take care of the housekeeping first off. I filed a separate affidavit of service and publication for each case, you which did, I did also file with planning several weeks ago. I do something about this Wi Fi. I do have hard copies of both. I will need those, counsel. I'm just watching the circle of death on my Surface Pro here. Thank you. So, Chairman, I want you to note how much faster this is when I have the paper in front of me and I don't have to wait for the Wi-Fi. Uh, Chairman, I've had the opportunity to review both affidavits of service proof of publication that was submitted electronically. I now have the originals in front of me. So first, with <coughs> respect to case P2023-0069, uh, we're going to mark those as A1 for purposes of the record. With respect to case P2023-0070, we're going to mark those as A1A for purposes of the record. Thank you, Council. Jurisdiction is proper before the board. Thank you, Mr. McCann. Thank you, Council. So just a brief introduction on both cases. Um, this board approved both of these cases in 2020. Um, the, the plans that were approved by the board went through resolution compliance with staff and they were signed by Mr. Chairman and the Secretary. 
And the plans that are being presented tonight are the exact same plans with no changes at all. Um, the reason that we're here tonight is that there were some procedural errors made um, by the prior legal team um, that handled this case. The plans themselves are correct. They have all the correct information on them. But um, the underlying documents that were filed with the board, applications, notices, agendas that were published, um, had some incorrect block and lot information and some incorrect address information. The, the only way I know to fix that is to, I corrected all of that information with my current application. Um, and I corrected all that with the current notices. And the, I believe we have an amendment that's properly before you tonight. Um, so uh, just a quick overview of what you're approving. Um, and I would need somebody to show me how to put this thing up on your screen. Okay. Uh, I'm seeing it on the screen behind you all. Are you seeing it on your screens? It, yeah, yeah, we have it on our monitor. You have it on your there monitor. There it is. Okay. And council approving, you're putting the horse before the cart, or the cart before the horse there. You said approving, what we're approving tonight. We might deny it. That would be, that would be <laughs> your, your, uh, your option, I imagine. In, in some ways, I'm relying on and trusting the board with this. Um, because I'm really correcting infirmities in the procedure and presenting you with the exact same plans um, that were previously approved. But I do appreciate what you're saying, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, Council, if I could just jump in, Chairman Board, I did have a opportunity to review this particular or both of these applications and have a uh, conversation with Mr. McCann specifically to the procedural issues that were presented as a result of what had transpired back in, in 2020. And there are times where a corrective resolution could be done by the board in order to correct something that was inaccurate in the resolution. But uh, out of an abundance of caution, uh, Mr. McCann felt more comfortable coming back to the board on a new application and correcting that resolution through an amendment uh, in order to clear up the paperwork and procedurally that is the best way to proceed. It's what I like to consider best practices because inevitably somewhere down the road this becomes an issue tied to the real estate that gets caught up whether it be in the financing aspect, in the sale aspect, in the further construction Somewhere down the road, something like this winds up getting flagged by somebody in a windowless room somewhere, and everybody cannot move forward, and then they're scrambling. So uh, for what it's worth, I'm very familiar with what the issue was and how it transpired. I believe it was more of a Scrivener error than anything else. But with that, Mr. McCann, uh, please proceed. So... Uh just to orient the board to what it is that we're asking tonight, if you look on the screen, you will see the, uh, the um, site plan that was approved uh, by the board in 2020. And you can see in the yellow is the parking garage um, that we're going to discuss tonight. Below it is the actual property, the first property, the Lincoln property. That property is a, is a property in the... Uh, that has been there for approximately 25 years or so. And the, there is currently on the yellow, or there was at the time of 2020 on the yellow, a parking lot that was providing parking for the Lincoln Project. And um, to the right, you will see that there is a second building with a second block and lot listed on that plan. That is a correct block and lot, as is the block and lot here and the block and lots up here. This is the Roosevelt Project, which, which is the second case that's before you tonight. And the, the relief that was requested and is being requested by the Roosevelt property is that its parking, which is 60 parking spaces that were, were approved in the early 2000s for parking in the Newport Mall, 
So what the Roosevelt is asking for is that should you again approve this parking garage on the yellow site, that you will allow and authorize the Roosevelt to move its 60 parking spaces from the Newport Mall to this parking deck. The parking deck, if approved again, will then serve um, to provide parking for both the Lincoln Project, which I'm scroll pointing to right now, and the Roosevelt Project, and there will still be two spaces in excess. That's the, uh, that's the proposal tonight. Um, that's what was presented to the board in 2020. Um, so just one more uh, or two more facts about the, the projects. Um, both projects fully complied with the parking requirements back when they were approved, and they still will comply with all the parking requirements. There are no variances or deviations for parking being requested. Um, having said that, I'm gonna call my first witness. I have three witnesses. One is the project architect. Uh, the second one is the civil engineer. And the third one is the planner. All three gentlemen are the same uh, presenters that uh, presented in 2020, and they're the ones that prepared these plans. Um, my first witness is Mr. Bill Cavanaugh. Yes, I do. Sure. William, W I L L I A M, last name Cavanaugh, K A V as in Victor, A N A G H. Mr. Cavanaugh, good evening. We've qualified you in the past. Uh, your license is current tonight? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're qualified. Great. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so uh, Jimmy did a great, great um, introduction there in terms of the site. So plan, plan uh, north is north is up. Um, the site is bounded by the 11th Street Viaduct on the south. Uh, you have Manila Ave on the east, Erie Street on the west. Immediately north are, I think, two gas stations that include a McDonald's and a Dunkin' Donuts, and then the 12th Street uh, main drive towards the uh, Holland Tunnel. Um, the site is very uh, narrow. It's 70 feet wide by 400 feet long. Um, about 15% of the perimeter will be exposed on the, the ends to the, to the Erie Street and Manila Street. Um, it's an existing surface lot of 94 spaces. Uh, we're proposing to add one level of parking above the existing parking lot. Uh, the existing lot is uh, consists of a two-way drive aisle with 90 degree parking and so the challenge is how to introduce ramps to get up to the second floor so what the plans propose were are to use a one-way traffic flow with angled parking which narrows the width of the garage which allows us to add ramps on the north and south uh, oh thank you there we go so uh, just to walk you through the functional design, so you, you would enter on Erie and uh, proceed towards the west and their angled parking. Then you could make a turn and access the speed ramp up to the next level, which brings you up to here. And then you continue the whole length of the garage to the east, turn down the second ramp, which brings you down. And then you can exit out through the garage or you could keep driving in circles until you uh, find a parking spot. So, um, what happened there? Site dimensions, functional design. So, how many total parking spaces are on that plan? Uh, 156. And this is the plan that you prepared for the 2020 hearing? Yes. And this is the same plan that we're presenting tonight, correct? Yes. Okay. And the design is exactly the same? Yes. Okay. All right. And, uh, um, Council, um, yes. can you grab that, the mic from behind you? Behind the, the one for public comment, or if there's another one on the podium? No, oh, I'm sorry. There's one right there, too. Might have to turn it on. Hello? Hello? Hello. Mm -hmm. There it is. Yeah. Okay, and how many parking spaces are on the lower level, Bill? 72. And there's 84 spaces on the second level? Yes. Okay. Um, now there were two. There was a design deviation. Two design deviations that were presented to the board previously. Correct. Yes. So 
One is drive aisle width. Right. So the, the parking geometrics. So uh, the drive aisle is eight. The angle of the stall is 76 degrees. Uh, Jersey City zoning code, I think, has 60 degrees, and then it jumps to 90. And then also the width of the drive aisle is different. So um, the width of the drive aisle, uh, according to the code, is, is 22. And according to your plan, there's 20 and 18 feet for drive aisles? Well, th their zoning code doesn't speak to an aisle width for 76 degree angled parking. Okay. So we're, we're, we're proposing 18 feet for 76 degree parking, which in my experience is consistent with our industry standards for, you know, 75 degree angle spaces, which is almost 76. Uh, that, that's, that is a reasonable level of service for, um, for a parking garage. Okay. It's industry, sta industry standards. Yes. Okay. Uh, I have no more questions of um, Mr. Cavanaugh. Just to point out that everything that's being presented to the, to the board tonight is on the city web portal, has been posted there for some time, and these are the same plans that were presented in 2020. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody, any questions? On a uh, quick question on the parking, when these parking spots, because they're angled, the way they're angled, they're going to be driving into the spot, not backing in. Correct. Correct. So as they come out, they'd have to back up. Correct. Go for it. Okay. I, I, I believe angled parking is easier to mm -hmm. pull in and out of versus 90 degrees. Sometimes it's a two maneuvers to, to get yourself centered in a 90 degree stall. So Unless you have somebody yeah. trying to back into one of these spaces. Correct. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cavanaugh. Thank you. Next witness is uh, civil engineer Adolph Montana. Yes, I do. Adolph Montana, A D O L F, uh, Montana, like the state, M O N T A N A. Mr. Montana, good evening. We've qualified you as well in the past. Your license is current tonight? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. And if you could, just uh, please turn that mic towards you. Thank you. Mr. Montana, you were the civil engineer in 2020 for the project? Yes, I was. And you presented the plans that were, pres that were uh, approved by the board in 2020? Yes, I did. Prepared them? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, now, there were a handful of. Oh, would you like to take the board through the site on one of your site on one of your sheets? Sure. Um, I'm I'm going to set up sheet five, the site plan. <coughs> so this is uh, sheet C five entitled the site plan. Uh, last revised uh, June 30, 2022. Uh, this is the plans that were um, signed by the by the board. Um, stated before, this is um, uh, the, the site is approximately 0.64 acres. It's known as Block 8801, uh, Lot 3 and 4. Uh, it's within the commercial strip uh, zone district. Um, it has Manila Avenue to the east, Erie Street to the west. Uh, 11th Street Viaduct on the south, and a McDonald's and a gas station on the on the north. Um, the existing condition before the the garage was con uh, constructed will be it will used to be 94 parking spaces on Great Parking Lot. Um, the garage, as stated before, uh, has 72 spaces on the lower level, 84 spaces on the upper level, for a total of 156 uh, parking spaces. That's an increase of 62 parking spaces from the, the existing conditions. Um, the applicant is also proposing to relocate 60 spaces from the mall to, to the site. Um, so the total parking spaces today is 162. After the garage constructed, it will be 165. In terms of the, the variances, uh, in terms of setback, the proposed building will be 1.7 feet for the front yard setback on both sides. Uh, where five foot is required. The side yard setback is uh, 1.3 and 1.7, uh, where two foot is required, 
and both combined uh, is three feet where five feet is required. Uh, we also seeking um, a, a variance on the impervious coverage, uh, which is it'll be 94.9 after construction where 75 is allowable. The existing condition right now is approximately 84.1%. Uh, in terms of the grading, we pretty much, uh, the structure sits on, on the existing, uh, part, uh, what do you call, surface parking lot. So the, the grading doesn't really change, it'll, it'll be the same. The only thing we're doing is on the east side, we're doing slight changes to accommodate for uh, four ADA parkings. Uh, in terms of uh, stormwater management, where we're not we're not a major development, uh, we're only disturbing 0.64 acres. Uh, therefore, we you know we don't need to do stormwater management. Uh, we are due collecting the surface uh, runoff from the upper level using uh, two two uh, 12 inch HDP piping uh, that that connects to existing manholes on Erie Street and Manila Avenue. In terms of landscaping, we're proposing uh, landscaping on the east side and the west side. We're proposing evergreen trees. We're also proposing evergreen shrubs and ornamental grasses. In terms of lighting, uh, we're proposing 11 LED area light fixtures mounted at 20 feet height, manufactured by Beacon uh, on the upper level. On the lower level, we are proposing 28 LED area light fixtures mounted at eight, uh, eight feet high. And pretty much like, like we stated, there's no changes to the plan. Uh, the variance, uh, variances were approved back in 2020. Um, so no other changes. Thank you. I have no questions of Mr. Montana. Okay, thank you, Mr. Montana. Anybody, any questions? No. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Next witness is uh, project planner, Mr. Brian McPeak. What'd you do, Brian? The battery went. I thought I did it. <laughs> I, I think we're okay without the. Uh, I do. Brian McPeak, B R I A N M C P E A K. Uh, Mr. McPeak, is your license current? Yes, my license is current. You're in licensed in the state of New Jersey? Correct. And um, you testified before this board in 2020? Yes. On these cases? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. You're qualified. Thank you. And you've also reviewed the plans that were presented to the board tonight again? Yes, I have. Okay. That's right. And um, Mr. McPeak, would you walk the board through the uh, parking deviation and the variances that are being requested tonight? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so uh, obviously the board's heard the, the presentation of the professional's description of the project site and the project this evening. Um, uh, the deviations at hand, I believe, have been identified as uh, two front yard deviations, one on either frontage, uh, where 1.7 feet is proposed, whereas uh, the uh, ordinance requirement is five feet. Uh, there's a side yard deviation uh, where 1.3 feet is proposed, where two feet is required. Uh, and uh, both sides combined is required to be three feet, excuse me, is proposed to be three feet where five feet is required. In addition, there is an impervious cover uh, variants, um, I believe it's stated that it's 94.9% where 75% uh, is, is required. Um, <coughs> those deviations, uh, it, as a planner, I would uh, view those as uh, recognizable by the board under uh, the statute at 40 colon 55D 70C2, uh, where the purposes of the act, to, to summarize or, or, or paraphrase, purpose of the act would be advanced by the benefits of the deviations uh, and the uh, 
benefits of the deviations would substantially outweigh any detriments. Uh, in addition, there's a couple of one or two design waivers based on uh, the discussion earlier by Mr. Kavanaugh. Uh, certainly, there's a 76 uh, uh, degree angled parking proposed where there's a limit, uh, the ordinance provides for 60 or 90. Um, that also results in a aisle width uh, that may or may not be a deviation, but considering those two as, as design exceptions uh, under the statute 40 colon 55D hyphen 51 point or 51B, uh, uh, the statutory requirement there is that the deviations or the exceptions uh, be reasonable and within the, within the general purpose and intent of the standards in the ordinance. Um, to revisit or discuss uh, my planning testimony regarding these, uh, these uh, variances in particular, first of all, of course, <laughs> I've visited the site. I've again visited the site. Um, as has been testified to, uh, we have a situation where we have a uh, relatively small parcel. It's tucked in uh, behind a commercial strip on uh, 12th Avenue, or 12th Street, excuse me, uh, where there's a couple fast food restaurants and a couple gas stations. And uh, to our south is the 11th Street Viaduct. Basically, uh, the site is virtually invisible uh, from the standpoint of its view from public rights of way uh, for the general traveler or the person <coughs> passing through the area. Um, uh, updating my review of, so turning to the deviations or the variances under uh, 70C2, uh, of course I've updated my uh, review of the master plan uh, uh, because the master plan has changed uh, in the intervening period. Um, from the statutory uh, framework, uh, I believe it's uh, purpose G is most principally advanced, that is to provide sufficient place or sufficient space uh, for uh, a variety of uses in keeping with the needs of, of uh, uh, the residents of the state of New Jersey. Obviously, uh, uh, my testimony previously and again tonight is that uh, relocating the parking into this area um, in this way is, uh, advances that purpose because we are creating a, uh, a more cohesive uh, relationship between the parking uh, for these two existing uses um, and rationalizing uh, generally the, uh, the arrangement of these uses with uh, sufficient space in, those, uh, in this location. Um, from the master plan standpoint, uh, the old master plan um, and the new master plan do advance uh, some things uh, reasonably the same and some things very differently. Uh, parking is an interesting one. Um, I think the master plan still supports what the old master plan spoke of, of addressing traffic congestion, acknowledging parking constraints in residential and commercial neighborhoods and districts throughout the city, and identifying strategies for managing that parking demand um, and enhancing the pedestrian environment. Uh, moreover, uh, the current land use element speaks to, on page 89, of the fact that while parking is essential for many residents, it must be provided in a way that minimizes impact on the streetscape and that recognizes the inefficiency of allocating valuable land to parking and preventing it from being used for more community-oriented uses. As I stated about the site itself, uh, my opinion, um, this site is unintrusive. It really doesn't provide in and of itself uh, for a lot of community-oriented uses. Um, and I think it, frankly, does provide a very efficient use of land uh, by uh, relocating this parking closer to the, uh, to the users of, uh, to where the users of the, uh, the parking reside. Um, turning to the, briefly to the redevelopment plan, it, uh, it continues to be essentially the same. So my uh, observations regarding the uh, way the parking, this, these variances uh, relate to the uh, local redevelopment plan. Uh, stand uh, uh, unaffected uh, there. Um, and uh, generally, I think, uh, as a planner, this, this project continues to advance the purposes of planning. Um, and so I think we've met the positive criteria under the, under the statute. From a detriment standpoint, um, I think my testimony previously was that there essentially were no detriments. Um, and I continue to feel that uh, 
uh, this project uh, advances the, uh, those purposes of planning with really uh, little or no um, detrimental uh, effect upon anybody, um, uh, local users or the general public. Uh, so I, I think the statutory criteria, the negative criteria rather, uh, continue to be met. With regard to touch upon the uh, design exception just briefly, as Mr. Cavanaugh noted originally and again tonight, the design of this facility is keeping with industry standards. Uh, so uh, uh, on that basis, I find that the, uh, the, the, the proposal is reasonable and within the general purpose and intent of the standard in the ordinance. Um, I think uh, just to summarize from there, considering all of this, it's my testimony that uh, the board is well within their rights to again approve this project under the statutory authority of uh, 4055D-70C2, mm -hmm. as well as uh, uh, the design exception uh, under that provision of the statute as well. Thank you. No further questions for Mr. McPeak. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anybody, any questions? Mm -hmm. No. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our presentation. Okay, thank you, Council. Is anybody here from the public that wants to comment on this application? If so, come on up. Seeing no public, I move to close the public. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded. Public is closed. Um, so Matt, are you handling on? I have a question for Matt. Sure, sure, go ahead. Uh, uh, Council, you stated at the beginning that um, the people from the Roosevelt wanted to move to the parking spaces that are going to be at the across from the Lincoln now? They requested to move over there? No. Um, I, th I, think, I think the genesis for this, for this change originally was that um, the, it's th parking in the Newport Mall, which is the required parking for the Roosevelt up until then, it's a little bit more dangerous to cross Marin Boulevard. The mall is um, an unrelated property that has been housing the parking for all these years. And I think the owner of the project just thought it already owns the parking lot and the parking lot is closer to the Roosevelt and it's an easier walk across the street. So it makes a lot of sense if this board would mm -hmm. approve it that was, that's the next question. to move the parking into this, into this deck. And that way it owns, it owns the deck and it can ensure that the parking will be there forever. The mall is owned by a different entity and nobody really knows what's happening to but, malls these days they can ch they could change over time yeah I, I just brought that up because I remember back in 2020 that we uh, that was a concern of I was let me speak for myself for uh, me the distance that they had to walk from the Roosevelt into the parking area so basically this is a closer walk for them it's a closer it's a walk safer, yes it's a safer it. walk also there's okay. I don't think there That's could be any question about that, that. Yeah. To clear up. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Eddie. Uh, Matt, are you handling this? Or is Cam? Uh, I am, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I, I reviewed the materials, uh, made part of this application, uh, and supervised uh, Ms. Uh, Jean Ru Wang as she prepared uh, her memo, dated February 8th, 2024. Um, they surmised the, the prior application and, and, and put a uh, new testimony on the record. Uh, to correct uh, the prior errors. Um, should the board make a motion to approve this application, uh, there are uh, six conditions that we are recommended in the memo. Um, one being that all the conditions from the prior approvals remain in full force and effect. Uh, we just ask if the applicant has reviewed that and if they agree to those conditions on the record. So yes, I've, I've reviewed the staff memo. Um, we agree to, are you asking for all the, us to agree to all the conditions, Matt? Uh, yes. Yes, okay. <clears throat> Just to point out, though, that there's one condition that talks about uh, review agent reports. Effectively, the applicant has already complied with that because it went through res resolution compliance in 2020, and in fact, the chairman and secretary have signed the plans that we're asking for approval tonight. So. We've, we've done that, but the rest of the, the rest of the conditions we agreed to. Okay. Agree, Matt? Sure. Okay. All right, I'll entertain a motion. Then. Mr. Chair, I'm going to make two motions. I'm going to start with uh, one. I'm, I move to approve uh, case P2023-0070 as presented to our board here tonight. Second. Okay, motion made and seconded for approval. 
Okay, on uh, case P2 dash, I'm sorry, P2 23 dash 0069, uh, Vice Chair Dr. Gonzalez. 70. Sorry, 70. Was it 70 first? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Sorry. Apologize. Uh, That's the right way. To Vice go. Chair Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, I, I like the changes. I do. I uh, appreciate you coming back. So I vote aye. Commissioner Gungadin? Aye. Commissioner Torres? I like the safety part of that change. Mm -hmm. It was always not comfortable the last time to walk towards the airport, so uh, with that, I vote aye. Commissioner Stamato? I vote aye. Commissioner Cruz? I vote aye. Commissioner Dr. Desai? Aye. And Chairman Lixton? Aye. Motion carries all in favor for P2023-0070. And Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a second motion to approve case P2023-0069 as presented to our board here tonight. Second. Okay. okay, motion made and seconded for approval. Vice Chair Dr. Gonzalez? Aye. Commissioner Gungadin? Aye. Commissioner Torres? Aye. Commissioner Stamato? Aye. Commissioner Cruz? Aye. Commissioner Dr. Desai? Aye. And Chairman Lexington? Aye. Motion carries all in favor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, always appreciate your time. Okay, we're going to take a 10-minute break, everybody. Uh, it is 6.51. We'll be back at 7.01. We'll call item 11 on the agenda is case P23-020. Uh, it's a preliminary and final major site plan with variances for 344 Second Street. Good evening, Council. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Michael Higgins of Castano Quigley Charami uh, on behalf of the applicant here um, this is for 344 Second Street. I, I guess first I'd like to take a moment to confirm receipt of our uh, notices. This was a while back. We carried it with preservation of notice. Good evening, Council. I am going to receive the affidavit of publication proof of mailing with respect to the application at 344 Second Street here in the city. I've had the opportunity to review it. It does appear to be in order. We can mark it as A1 for purposes of the record. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is 344 Second Street. It's a 2,144 square foot lot uh, right on Second Street. It's between Coles and Monmouth, um, right about where Second Street intersects with uh, Newark Avenue. Um, it's NC zoning, and what we're proposing to do is to demolish the existing four story, four unit building on that property and construct a five-story uh, mixed-use building. It's going to have uh, ground floor, floor commercial space and then seven uh, dwelling units on the upper floors. Uh, to do this, we need some relief from this board. That includes preliminary and final major site plan approval. Um, and we need a couple of C variances for uh, rear yard setback. Um, and I'd note with regards to that, there's an alleyway in the rear of the property, as you see on many blocks in Jersey City. Um, this, I, I believe our argument will be, uh, that helps provide sufficient light and air to the adjacent properties. Um, I'd also note that, uh, the, according to the tax assessor, half of that alleyway is considered uh, part of the applicant's property. And it's therefore somewhat of a question whether we need that variance to begin with, but we did notice for it and are prepared to testify to it uh, to be somewhat conservative. Um, and the second variance that we need is for uh, rooftop bulkhead coverage. Um, that's primarily for uh, ADA accessibility to the roof deck, as our architect will testify to in more detail. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to have our architect, uh, Chris Botch, sworn in. Name's Christopher Botch, B-C-H-R-I-S-D-O-P-H-E-R, B-O-T-S-C-H. And Mr. Uh, Botch, good evening. We've qualified you in the past, I believe, right? Um, no, I no? Not. Okay. <coughs> uh, if you could just go over your qualifications. First. Sure. Uh, I have a BA in architecture uh, from New York Institute of Technology. Uh, I have been in the industry for 25 years. Uh, I've been licensed since 2017. I am licensed in New York and New Jersey. And is that license in New Jersey current tonight? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're qualified. Okay, Chris. Uh, 
Chris, okay. if you could just walk the board through the plans briefly. Okay. Uh, first page has all of our zoning information as well as our floor area calculations. <laughs> um, we are. Let me just shoot in here to our floor areas. Um, each floor is just just over 1,900 square feet, uh, save for the first floor, which we have insets to account for the doors being able to swing out of the building. Um, we do <laughs> consist of seven total units. We have six one-bedroom units, and we have one two-bedroom unit in the pro in a project. Um, we do also have a full basement underneath the property. Uh, here is a side-by-side -side comparison of the existing building to the proposed building. Your existing building is on the left. Uh, the existing building also has a does have a uh, basement. Uh, the new building will expand that basement space, and it will add some commercial storage up in the front, as well as a fire sprinkler room to be able to fully sprinkler the building. We will also have a, a commercial refuse enclosure in the basement, which will contain 48-gallon uh, 48, 48 uh, wheeled containers. Um, then moving further back, we have some uh, chain, um, chain storage areas, one for each storage unit, uh, one for each uh, apartment. Uh, we also have an enclosed um, uh, refuse room, which will have four, uh, sorry, five 48 gallon wheeled containers for refuse to be removed. We will be maintaining <laughs> two means of egress out of the basement as well as elevator access. Moving one floor up to the commercial space, we will have about just over 1,200 square foot of commercial space. The building has a 10 foot setback at the rear, so that space. Oh, sorry about that. That space will have a uh, a fence with a panic panic bait, uh, panic gate on it for to allow egress out the rear. So we will maintain two means of egress from the upper floors as well as from the main floor out into the main street. There will be a rated fire corridor that will provide access from both egress stairs from the basement to the, uh, to the outside. The stair from upstairs on the upper floors will, direct, will, be, will egress directly out to the rear, and the front will come into its, a small uh, lobby space in the corridor, and then egress straight out. <coughs> the upper floors, uh, Upper floors are fairly similar. Uh, floors two, three, and four are all the same. They will have a main living space at the, uh, against the outside wall, as well as a one bedroom. They have a galley style kitchen, along with a fully ADA compliant bathroom, as well as a washer and dryer for in unit use. Front, the front unit is a little narrower, but pretty much a mirror of the, the same. Each unit will also have a small den or home office space towards the back of the unit. These are the, this is the fourth floor, which again is the same as the two and three. The fifth floor up on top will be set back uh, 10 foot from the street line. It will have its own outside space and a small piece of green roof. That space will have locked off access from the elevator for direct access for the tenant. The, um, it will have the bedroom and um, master bedroom and a regular bedroom at the, at the rear, along with a walk-in closet and a ADA bathroom, as well as a walk-in closet for the secondary bathroom, a secondary bedroom, and as well as a full ADA compliant bathroom servicing the rest of the unit. This, this unit will also have a small den space, which will be closer to the front of the unit with sliding doors into the main living space. Uh, up on the roof, we have provided two means of egress. So each stair goes all the way up to the roof to provide access. We've also provided a, a vestibule at the roof, along with the elevator providing handicap access to the roof area. Up on the roof, we have multiple individual uh, green, uh, private spaces for patios. These will be individual per unit. Um, we have individualized them with small uh, dividing walls. We have a taller dividing wall in between uh, space to space and a shorter retaining wall across the front of the walkway to give some kind of 
uh, privacy, but not be obtrusive. This will also have green roof at the rear, as well as green roof in the front, <coughs> and then a smaller green roof portion as you come out the elevator. Most of the green roof up here will be more of the um, extensive tie, which is more two to six inches, a lot of uh, lightweight uh, uses, mosses, grasses, sedums. Um, the main area in the center, which is a little more decorative, will be more of a semi-intensive, which is about a five to seven. It goes up to the same kind of grasses as well as it'll go up to some small shrubs. Um, also on here is the details of the bike parking, which we have in, located also in the basement. We are only required to have four. Um, the way these nest together, <coughs> we, get, we make provisions for 18 bicycles in the basement. Moving to the facade, the facade, uh, the intent is to use a thin brick system. Um, that way we can use um, a brick to more match some of the other buildings in the, in the neighborhood. Um, we don't want to use anything too new. We'd like to use something that's got a little bit more character to it um, to match in with what we have. Uh, to add a little bit more of the contemporary look, we, are, we have a more contemporary storefront style window. Um, which will have small operable panels and provide a significant amount of light into the space. The lower area of the commercial will have some full height uh, extruded aluminum storefront, as well as a dark signage band across the top of that space. Uh, here also you can still see the uh, proposed along with the existing to the right. Um, as you can see here, you have the, uh, but the uh, rooftop stairs, which is part of the relief we're asking for by having these stairs, both stairs go all the way up to provide the two means for the small roof spaces. <coughs> Moving to the rear, the rear will be very similar, except it'll be a little bit wider. So you see on the right hand side, it'll be the same finishes, but we have four windows instead of three. <coughs> to match the cadence either side we'll be doing uh, a stucco type uh, uh, finish so for in the event that there's something built next door we don't have to deal with any, any kind of issues with that we will have uh, we will use a color we'll probably match the brick um, so everything can be uniform in look and color and tone and that's about all I have <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, if the board prefers, he, we can address architectural questions now, or we can reserve. Please, sure. please, yeah, let's get questions out. Um, Mr. Bosch, if you could go back to, uh, I didn't catch the sheet number. I'm trying to bring it up right now. Um, the partitions on the roof. Sure. Um, concerned about the higher privacy partitions. How are they anchored? The they floor. will be anchored by uh, aluminum poles, post that's anchored into the floor. They are only going up to five foot on the highest side. So they won't be totally private, but they'll have a greater level of privacy. Those will all be anchored down into the roof structure. Okay, so they actually go to the roof structure, not just the... <coughs> Correct. The um, raised deck, I should say, I Correct. guess. Correct, right? and the decking that we're using up there is it's raised up on pylons. Mm -hmm. So when it drops in, almost like a tile. Okay, understood. So that way we can maintain water mitigation underneath. And sure. Okay, that was my only question. Anybody else? Any questions? Yes, I have no question. Uh, the, um, same thing on the same page. Your rooftop uh, spaces. Mm -hmm. You have seven units, six spaces. How the, are you? The, the f unit five has its own space in the front of the building. Unit five has its own space. Correct. That's the one on that's the top. Right. You're right. I saw that. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I also have our engineer present, but I think we'll reserve the right unless the board has questions specific to uh, engineering, civil okay. engineering. Um, Understood. So my next witness is Charles Height, our professional planner. Uh, Charles has presented before this board many times. Um, Charles, is your license still? Let's get him sworn in first. I do. Yes. First name Charles, last name Height, H E Y D T. Mr. Height, good evening. We've qualified you before. Your license is current tonight? Still current, yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're qualified. Um, I don't know if I can easily get to a better visual. Um, yeah. 
Um, so this is just a, a, a sheet from our uh, civil set C301. Um, I'm just going to scroll here for the benefit of the board. So I'm just going to fill in a couple details with respect to the requested relief. We are looking at a um, minimum rear yard setback. Um, 15 feet required uh, approximately. It's, it's technically calculated at 15% of lot depth, which is 14.47 feet. What's being proposed is 10 feet, which is 10.4 feet. Um, so we are still providing a rear yard. Um, what was referenced earlier in the introduction is the fact that um, this, lot is, this lot is undersized in terms of lot depth. 97 feet is what's existing today, where typically in the NC district you have a lot depth of 100. So that accounts for three of that five-foot differential. Um, what also is important to recognize is that we do benefit from a, an alleyway that does run between uh, Coles and Monmouth. Uh, that alleyway is 10 feet in width, so if you take it to the center point line, that's an additional five feet that benefits uh, the rear yard or interior of the block. So um, if we were measuring to the center line, we would be in excess of the required rear yard. Um, but be it that as it may, from a conservative standpoint to the property line, we are proposing 10 feet where 15 feet, 14.47 feet required. Uh, a couple other metrics on that that we typically calculate is on a typical lot, your building footprint is, um, t again, 25 by 100. Your building footprint can be approximately 2,125 square feet. What's being proposed is still consistent, albeit undersized for the, uh, an undersized lot. It's 1,911 square feet, as was mentioned uh, by Mr. Bosch. Um, we do pr propose appropriate bedroom mix and, and square footages, so the six bedroom units range from 644 square feet to 720, which are pretty standard for the city, and we do have a two bedroom uh, unit, which is, is, has a, a nice size to it, 1,350 square feet. Um, so again, not trying to increase the unit count, increase the building footprint by increasing or decreasing unit sizes. Um, one, uh, um, one, uh, uh, a, a couple additional points on the uh, maximum rooftop appurtenance coverage. Uh, we are, again, we are referencing a, an undersized lot where not only is it 97 feet deep, it's also 21 feet wide. Um, in this instance, the uh, rooftop appurtenance coverage is again provided by a maximum percentage, um, so it adversely or um, uh, it adversely affects undersized properties where a maximum of 20 percent uh, is permitted. What's being proposed tonight is 34.4 percent, um, and that is really only calculated of the um, staircases, the elevator, and the vestibule. There's no other interior enclosed spaces on the rooftop. Um, as you saw from the rooftop plan, we're looking at uh, common rooftop spaces, albeit partitioned, uh, as well as the green roof spaces. So uh, again, it's the minimum needed to accommodate ADA access, um, and that's really the design end of it. Um, with respect to uh, furthering purposes of the land use law, I do think that this advances purpose A, to provide appropriate development uh, and uh, to promote public health and general welfare in the state of New Jersey. Uh, purpose C, to provide adequate light, air, and open space. Again, uh, referencing that internal condition of the block as a whole, there's adequate light and air into the rear of the properties. Um, and that, that is a vehicular access, um, albeit not improved. Vehicles do uh, travel down there, so it's not that uh, very passive, protected rear yard that other blocks might have that don't have an alleyway. So it's a little bit more of an active interior to the block. And then lastly, um, to provide for a desirable visual environment through creative design techniques um, and good civic design, I do think uh, introducing a commercial ground floor unit along the NC district, um, making it uh, a little bit more of a, of a modern uh, feel on the ground floor with the windows uh, as well as the traditional brick above uh, fits within that um, design intent of the land use law. Um, with respect to the negative criteria, um, I do uh, think that 
This is consistent with the, the zoning and the master plan. So the NC district is, uh, the purpose is to recognize the existence of and importance of neighborhood business districts and provide ground floor commercial and mixed use buildings to promote walkability. This hits that purpose right on the, uh, on the face value of it. Um, with respect to the master plan, um, we are meeting certain objectives, uh, strengthening, strengthening neighborhood oriented commercial areas, again, reinforcing that mixed use ground floor um, component, ensuring the city's available housing is balanced and meets the needs of all current and future city residents. Again, appropriate sized units, uh, mix of units, and then um, to promote the development of a diversified economy, obviously, with the mixed use building. Um, with respect to any impairment of uh, or detriment to the public good or general welfare, um, we did do uh, a visual impact assessment. Uh, again, the whole rationale is that given the alleyway, there's less of an impact as if it were on a conforming lot because of the greater separation interior to the block. So um, we didn't find any substantial impact with the additional rear yard, um, given everything else is consistent. And with respect to the um, rooftop bulkheads and stair the staircases elevator, they're located centrally in the whole orientation of the, the rooftop, set back from the front, set back from the rear. So there's no, uh, no detriment with respect to the location and uh, square footage of, of those elements on the rooftop. That's my direct testimony. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Height. Um, I have no questions for Mr. Height. Anybody else? No. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Council, that, is that your presentation? That does conclude uh, all of our direct testimony. I just note that the comments from the engineering memo and the uh, staff memo are acceptable to the applicant. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. You have a question? Yeah. I thought he said he had an engineer that was going to speak on this, or no? They didn't have nobody. Just I, Mr. If we I have just the planner. If we want, if we want the testimony. If we I, want the testimony, we can have it. I have our engineer present. If uh, if there's any civil related questions, I can I can call him up. I had a couple of safety questions, and I know they are going to be um, basically in every development. We they're going to be it's not in our jurisdiction, but um, I do have a concern. My concern is based on the adjacent properties. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, uh, the adjacent properties to that building, um, and I, I know the. People that lived there were like third generations of people that lived in that neighborhood. Okay. Um, wouldn't be able to afford any mishap happen to their property because of the construction of that building. Right. I mean, um, especially the one to the left. Okay. I think you will put that family out of, uh, if they're still there too. I've, I mean, I'm going, I'm there every, I grew up on that block, so I, I was, yeah, ju just, for uh, the, just for the record, when, when we do the excavation and we do the underground work, it will be engineered to make sure that we provide all the temporary shoring yes, needed to go through the process. I've seen a very big developer on Third Street across the street from St. Mary's lose two buildings there. And he does high-rise work. Uh, so that's my concern, you know, just because I understand we all, and I, I work in a construction trade, we all go in there with the intent of always... Nothing's going to go wrong. Um, but you're taking out the footings of the existing building and putting your, your new no, footings. No, no. The, 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 the existing footings will remain, and we're going to add on to them and underpin as, as needed. Okay, so you're not going to try to remove the old footings at all. Okay, that's, the, that's what becomes an issue. Correct. Okay. Um, have you spoken to the neighbors to the left and the right from you? Is that, uh... Me, per se, I have not. We have not reached out directly to the... Yeah, uh, not reached out to nobody there. We've you're gonna, thought, their we've, buildings are like squeezed together, and you're not, you didn't think it would be a good idea to talk to them? Uh, it could be. We've I'm pretty sure that, they yeah. got a notice, so... Uh, I could say we've noticed within 200 feet, as always, noticed, and we've also... We've, we've met with VNA, the local community group, as well. A while I mean, there's back. a young man there that lost his legs, basically, and uh, worked construction all his life. Mm -hmm. Um, he can't renovate that house and rebuild it again, his family. Um, but they've been there forever, you know? No, I, um, I would... Uh, I, I appreciate I, I uh, On the record, though, yeah. every building that we do in Jersey City goes with the intent of being safe and done correctly. 
uh, I wish you just follow that passage because that is a tight, it's tight there uh, with the footage of the other building and the people that live there are um, a pillar to that community. They, they've been there for years. They've been there for years. So It's 100% uh, our intention to do it as safely as you can. You'll have good neighbors if you speak to them. They, 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 they're good people. Uh, yeah. That's what I'm going to say on the record. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Eddie. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Council. So at this time, let's open it up for public comment. If anybody's here on this application that wants to speak, now's your time. Mr. Chair, I see no public. I move to close. Second. Okay. Motion is made and seconded. Public is closed. Uh, Cam. Uh, it's, it's, no, it's this me. is Matt. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no problem, Chair. Uh, uh, in reviewing this application, um, I can confirm that uh, we've provided testimony on the record we being st city planning staff, that these properties in, uh, in this area with alleys uh, do in fact, uh, under the direction of the tax assessor, do that, that, that um, 100 foot depth rather than 95 feet. Uh, and uh, as uh, Mr. Higgins put on the record, out of, uh, out of uh, being ultra conservative in their presentation, uh, and their notice that they're asking for this rear yard variance. Uh, staff agrees with uh, the, the testimony put on the record regarding their uh, pertinence coverage on uh, this rather uh, uh, small lot size. Um, the part of the coverage is also uh, an outcome of them putting more mechanics on the, uh, and mechanical on the roof. Um, this property or project as designed uh, doesn't have uh, PTAX um, so they are looking for uh, to other spaces like the roof for for uh, the handling of, of the and location of those. Um, in the review of this application, staff did put together a staff memo dated November twenty second, twenty twenty three. Since this uh, memo was produced, the uh, ap applicant received comments regarding their facade uh, and the changes were made and those were what were presented here tonight uh, to their, their front and rear facade. Um, but the staff recommended conditions in the memo still stand um, and staff would uh, recommend if the, if the board makes a motion to approve that the applicant agree to those conditions and we put those conditions on the record. Yes. And again, you... The applicant agrees to those conditions. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, staff recommends approval. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Hey, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve case P23-020 as presented to our board tonight. Do okay. I have a second? Second. Okay. Motion made and seconded for approval. Okay. Vice Chair, Dr. Gonzalez. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Gangadin. Yeah. Um, I think the variants um, are minor and there is no detriment. Um, and it's also in line with the goals and objective of the master plan. My vote is aye. Commissioner Torres. No, just uh, the other thing I want to speak on is the uh, thing on that alleyway. Um, I'm just hoping that all the alleyways that we have in Jersey City and the downtown area always stay the way they are, never get changed. Um, you know, it's a very big part of that downtown area. And um, with the safety aspect being taken care of, I, uh, I vote aye. Thank you. Commissioner Stamato? I vote aye. Commissioner Cruz? I vote aye. Commissioner Dr. Desai? Aye. Chairman Langston? Um, yeah, I do agree with uh, Commissioner Gangadin. I, I think this meets the goals and objectives of the master plan and the intent. Uh, so my vote is aye tonight. Motion carries all in favor on a motion okay. to approve. Thank you, everybody. Let's move on to item 12 is case P23-070 is a minor site plan with C variances for 355 to 357 SIP Ave. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm doing this one as well. Uh, Michael Higgins of Castano Quigley and Cherami on behalf of the applicant. 355-357 um, SIP. This is a irregularly shaped uh, corner lot um, right at the intersection of SIP and Emerson Avenues. Um, what the applicant's proposing to do here is to demolish the existing two-family dwelling and garage structure on the property. 
and, and construct a single family home. This is in the R1 zone. Um, for this, we need preliminary and final site plan approval with a few variances. I looked over the agenda and I saw there were only two listed. There's actually three here. We have a variance for um, front yard setback, for bulkhead setback, and then a de minimis building height setback that was missed of 0.42 feet. Um, so uh, with that, um, our first witness is our architect of Art Patel. Council, did you say rear yard setback or front? It's uh, front yard. It, it's, oh, we have. Excuse me. Um, we have rear. Combined front and rear yard setback. So rear yard setback. Okay. I misspoke. No. Excuse me. Council, before we swear in the witness, this is a notice case. I am in receipt of your affidavit of publication proof of mailing with respect to the application 355 357 SIP AV. It does appear to be in order. We're going to mark it for A1 for the record, Chairman. And Council, we are collecting the originals the night of the hearing, so moving forward, I'm going to need you to actually bring the originals with you now that we're back in public. Understood. Thank you. Do that. Okay. Um, yep. You swear in your testimony you give tonight's going to be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. For the record, can you state and spell your name, please? Uh, Avart Patel, A-A-V-A-R-T, P-A-T-E-L. Mr. Patel, good evening. Uh, we've qualified you in the past, I don't think in person, but we've qualified you online, correct? Yes. Okay, and is your license uh, current tonight? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you, sir. You're qualified. Thank you. Okay, Bart, if you don't mind just walking the board through the uh, plans that you prepared. Sure. Um, as you can see there, the property is located at the corner of the Emerson and, uh, and SIP Avenue. Uh, the lot is, uh, as Michael mentioned, it's an irregular lot, uh, especially along the front. Uh, the, the front yard is, or front property line is at an angle. Um, I'm gonna go to the first floor plan uh, or the site plan uh, to begin with. Uh, as you can see on the uh, the left side, it's, a, it's a, the existing structure demolition plan, and uh, on the right side, it's the proposed uh, um, development. Uh, it's a single-family home. Um, Going to go to the next slide, which is uh, actually let me just kind of a uh, little bit uh, here. Um, the uh, the the front of the house along uh, uh, Sip Avenue is. Uh, is uh, basically the, it's orthogonal to um, Emerson Avenue, uh, and uh, 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 the setback along the front line uh, varies. Uh, you know, on the left side it's a little more, and on the right side it's it's uh, less because of the angle of the the front property line. Um, the the neighboring property has uh, e existing steps going up to the uh, second level, and we have situated a building in, in a way where where um, that uh, left front left corner is is uh, basically almost towards the end of the step, so it doesn't uh, block any uh, any views or or you know it's for safety purposes looking into the uh, in intersection at the uh, Emerson and Sip Avenue. Um, Going to um, again, this is the uh, another iteration of the site plan, which uh, shows a little uh, larger uh, or blow off of, uh, of the site. Um, go to the floor plans. Uh, all right. So uh, the one on the left side is the uh, the basement plan, which is uh, uh, mainly the utility and, and service spaces. Um, this house is proposed with the elevator, so you see an elevator pit at the at the basement level, and a stair uh, just to uh, to access the services. Um, on the right side, it's the first floor plan. Um, am I going too fast? No. Okay. Um, the first floor has uh, um, <coughs> one uh, front to back. You know, the front side has the the family living space, uh, the central entry foyer in the middle. And on the left side, there's a uh, there's a um, a, ba uh, a bedroom with a with the uh, attached bath, um, <coughs> dining and uh, family areas in the uh, located in the middle. Um, there's a small office uh, <coughs> with the access from uh, um, from the rear yard or, or the side entry, um, and then um, 
a small pantry service kitchen here. Um, elevator and then uh, a powder room is located by the, by the dining area. Uh, moving on to the second floor, um, this level has, uh, uh, you know, a larger living and, and a dining space as well as, a, you know, private like a media room uh, and then uh, one study and, and a um, bedroom, two bedrooms with the, with one with the attached bath, one with the, with the uh, hall bath. Um, Moving on to the third level, which is uh, primarily all the, the bedroom spaces. Um, we have uh, uh, five bedrooms at this level with, uh, uh, with uh, three being, or two being, um, uh, we call it a master because of the, uh, the, the family size, but you know, the two masters with the, with the attached bath and a, and a walk-in closet. Um, uh, two smaller uh, bedrooms, one with the attached and then the other one would be using the, the hall bath. Um, going to the roof level, uh, there's a um, accessible roof proposed. Uh, 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 most of the roof on the perimeter is a uh, is a slope roof, uh, and then the uh, the area in the middle is more like a. Uh, um, so the roof around the perimeter acts as a privacy screen, and then the center area, which is flat, uh, which would be uh, accessible occupied roof. Um, uh, there's one staircase going to the roof level. It's a uh, pretty small area, and where uh, one staircase uh, will be uh, will be enough to service this this um, for a single family use. Um, Going to go to the front elevation. As you can see, the elevation is uh, uh, is primarily uh, the the brick facade with uh, with uh, uh, some cantilever base. Uh, would would be uh, you know uh, typical traditional trim work. Uh, 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 around the windows, um, asphalt single side <coughs> siding. Uh, there is a, a like a covered balcony proposed at the, the top uh, right hand corner, as you can see, um, on the third level, uh, which would be accessed from that uh, uh, master uh, bedroom space. Uh, <coughs> looking at the uh, Emerson um, Avenue elevation, again, similar uh, uh, type of treatment. Um, as you can see, the, the balcony, which is at the corner of the building um, from the master, and then the, uh, the side entrance to that uh, office space. Um, uh, again, this facade would be primarily uh, brick as well. Um, this is the uh, rear elevation. Um, we are going to wrap the brick around the, uh, around the corner and then... Um, uh, rest of the the facade beyond that line would be um, uh, would be vinyl siding. Um, this is the interior side elevation I would call it uh, along the neighbor's property, and that would be uh, siding as well. Um, these are a couple of iterations showing the uh, the sight lines, and especially in regards to the the bulkhead. Um, from uh, um, SIP Avenue as well as the Emerson Avenue side. Um, I'm going to go back to the first floor plan showing where, okay, as you can see uh, towards the back of the house, uh, uh, we're proposing a, a small deck. Uh, this deck would be like a, just a one step above the, uh, above the grade, so uh, one or two steps. So as you can see, the wraparound uh, steps uh, and then a um, uh, deck would be located attached to the house. Uh, there is a garbage enclosure proposed uh, uh, next to that, which would be tucked behind this, uh, this bump out uh, um, towards the back. Uh, it would be screened uh, with, uh, with gates. I guess that's, uh, that's about it for my direct testimony. Okay. Uh, thank you, Avart. Uh, I don't have any more questions for Mr. Patel. Um, but. Thank you. Mr. Patel, uh, just a couple questions. I, I Maybe I missed it. How many bedrooms are we talking about here? I think it's uh, eight in eight total. Eight bedrooms? That's a lot of bedrooms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can we go to the backyard plan? Sure.
Okay, could you zoom in there for us? Thank you. Perfect. Is there any kind of fencing between the parking and the grass? Uh, no, there is no fencing. Okay, so what prevents anybody from parking on the grass? Um, Mr. Chair, if I, I suppose if that's a concern, we may be able to address that with a condition uh, yeah. of approval. Yeah, I think we'd want a condition of approval that there's uh, some kind of decorative fencing. Um, Cam, this is yours. What do you think about a, a height, size? Do you want to work with the applicant? Yeah, and even a concrete curb would suffice and be perhaps. Mm. Mm. Concrete curbs can be knocked out very easily. A board on board fence. Yeah, six I think feet that would. Tall. I think that would be the best. Board on board fence. Maybe not six feet tall. I don't know if it has to be that extreme, but we will figure six out. Feet tall. Yeah. Yeah. Four mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'd be happy with four. That's uh, rear yard. Yeah, because that's a front lot. condition. Yeah. I think you have two fronts. <coughs> it's a corner lot, Chairman. Okay. Okay, we'll do four feet. Yeah, I think we'd be happy with four. With the material that's specified in our local ordinance on design standards, for the R1. Okay. okay, thank you, Council. Um, those are my only questions. Anybody else? Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Sorry, go ahead. Don't I have ahead. a question. What is the size of the lot and how many parkings you have in there? Um, do you want to cover that? Just a second. It's 4,254 square feet. Um, so the lot is uh, 4,254 square feet. Uh, there is an existing garage uh, at the back of the house, which uh, we are demolishing, uh, and then uh, two uh, surface parking would be provided uh, as part of the proposed design. Okay. I have a quick question on the office. You, I think you said the office had a separate entrance? Uh, that is correct. It's uh, not a separate entrance. It's a side entry. Okay. Uh, let me just go to the first floor plan well it has direct access to the outside right uh yes okay I, that's that was my question okay anybody else any questions okay thank you mr patel appreciate it thank you Robert. okay my uh last witness is charles height again um he was already sworn in uh, and uh charles your license still remains current yes it does <laughs> He lost it in the interim. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. So, Mr. Hyde, uh, just for the record, you have been uh, qualified, sworn in, and are still on the road tonight. Recognized. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right. Good evening again, board members. Um, so, we are dealing with the uh, front rear yard calculation for the rear yard requirement. Uh, I'll quickly run through a few numbers. That's the, the main um, setback variance we're looking at tonight. Um, we are in the R1 district standards, so we are uh, at the timing of this application um, going forward with those requirements. Um, from a front yard standpoint, it's a minimum of 2.58 feet. When you factor in the rear yard requirement, uh, uh, rear yard setback that's being proposed, 27.26 feet, you come to a, a combined total of 32.42 feet. Uh, that's short of the required 35 front rear yard combined requirement. Um, so again, uh, as was uh, discussed in the architectural presentation, I just will uh, get to the front cover. Um, there's a few additional factors I just wanted to speak to in terms of um, consistency with the uh, oh. Yeah. I don't know where we went. On the cover sheet, uh, if you could. Uh, not the table. Oh, the side property. Yep, a lot of good good information down at the bottom. So I'll, I can take over. <laughs> so uh, I have to thank Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Bajaj. So um, she's very thorough in her plans, and uh, I'm going to re be referencing her cover sheet here. Um, this is the existing front uh, front yard along Sip Avenue. You can see it's a corner property. Um, we are orienting the proposed structure along SIP Avenue. It will be quite consistent with the adjacent three-story structures to the uh, 
east of the subject property that also run along SIP Avenue. Uh, along the, oops. Along the Emerson Street frontage, sorry. Oh, wow. I am not used to this mouse. Okay. All right. You can see on. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Got a. You know, this mouse is high tech. Where's. Where? Okay. Emerson Street frontage, uh, Emerson Avenue frontage. Uh, you can see we do have an existing structure. Um, one of the questions about existing uh, curb cuts and driveway access on the right here, we do have a detached, detached garage that we will be removing, and that actually increases substantially the light and air to the adjacent property along Emerson Avenue. Um, we are maintaining the curb cut uh, and the two off-street parking spaces, uh, so there will be no impact. Um, we are not introducing a curb cut along SIP Avenue. Uh, there is none today. Um, so that will be in main, maintaining in an appropriate locate uh, in an appropriate design there. Um, with respect to the front yard, uh, that really does create a little bit of our uniqueness to the site. You can see the um, the front yard along Sip Avenue runs at an angle. Most of the other properties along Sip Avenue all, are also affected by the same taper um, to the this end of the block where one of the sides is substantially larger in terms of front yard, the other is substantially smaller. Um, we did go through the calculation. Um, the adjacent setback is two feet, seven inches, which is what we are proposing uh, at minimum on, on our proposed uh, property at the corner here. Um, and that's really what how we started dictating the location and orientation of the building. So this is a helpful diagram, uh, again, on the cover sheet of the architectural plans. Um, Part of the overall design you spoke to to accommodate the single family home. Um, we're removing the uh, non conforming detached garage structure, uh, creating an increase in, in light and air to um, not only the proposed structure but also the existing structure along Emerson Avenue. Um, those all, in my opinion, do amount to um, a benefit to the overall design, but we are also working with a unique uh, shape of the property. Uh, one thing that we did uh, wanted to clarify. Uh, in terms of uh, the overall calculation of building height, what's permitted in the R1 is a maximum of 35 feet. Uh, we do have to factor in, factor in a average grade. Uh, upon working with the plans, we did calculate that. That calculation landed us at 35.42 feet. Uh, that's a total of five inch inches in excess of what would be permitted for a single family home in the R1. Uh, it is a technical variance. Um, I do agree that it would be de minimis in this case because of the overall design. We're not introducing another story that's not permitted or anything like that. Um, it's really just about uh, where the placement of the um, lower level is in respect to the <coughs> average grade on the property, given the topography. So I do think it's, again, a C1 test where there's a uniqueness to the topography of the property as it slopes across the frontage, the SIP Avenue frontage, um, and there's no detriment in terms of the requested relief. In terms of uh, the last variance we're requesting with respect to rooftop or pertinent setback, um, we are taking a measurement from uh, Emerson Avenue. We do comply with the SIP Avenue setback. With respect to Emerson Avenue, we're at 19.17 feet. Uh, what's required, uh, obviously it's based off the proposed height of the appurtenance, is 9.75 feet. Uh, so again, we're less than one foot uh, out of compliance with this setback. Uh, and again, it's along the Emerson Street, Emerson Avenue frontage, um, which we do propose um, uh, a stairway bulkhead um, uh, to the roof as well as the, the overall um, overall bulkhead for the, for the overall design. Um, with respect to special reasons to uh, further the grant of these variances, um, I do think that we are, aim, we are meeting purpose A, to, provide, to, per, to guide appropriate use of the property and development that promotes general welfare. Uh, purpose C, as I spoke to, we're actually increasing the light and air, not only to this subject property, but also to the adjacent property. That's purpose C. And we're proposing a, promoting a desirable visual environment through creative design techniques, uh, which is purpose I. And I do think that uh, is consistent with the adjacent context along this this uh, streetscape along SIP Avenue. 
With respect to the negative criteria, I don't believe there's any substantial detriment to the uh, zoning ordinance. Again, we're a permitted use, um, which we're meeting the intent of the R1 district. Um, we are removing a residential use, but proposing uh, a new residential use. It's, it's uh, a compatible infill development, and it, it uh, obviously is reinforcing the residential, neighbor, uh, residential neighborhood in the R1 district. Um, with respect to any substantial detriment to the public good or welfare, uh, again, notwithstanding the variance needed, um, 35 feet doesn't warrant the evaluation of shadow impacts, although we're compliant on all other bulk standards for the property with respect to side yard setbacks. Um, and as I mentioned, I think we actually are, are making an improvement here with removing that detached ground uh, one-story garage. Um, with that, I complete my, uh, my direct testimony and be happy to answer any questions the board might have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Height. Anybody, any questions? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Mr. Higgins? That does conclude um, our testimony this evening. Um, I just note again uh, that the conditions stated in the staff memo are acceptable to the applicant uh, with the additional condition that we've mentioned uh, related to the four foot fence. Okay. Uh, adjacent Excellent. to the parking. Okay, thank you. So at this time, let's open it up for public comment. If anybody's here from the public that wants to comment on this application, please come on up to the mic. Mr. Chair, seeing no public, I move to close. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded. Public is closed. Cam, do you have anything you wanna add? Um, okay, so um, firstly, I just wanted to thank the applicant for agreeing to the conditions and adding the condition for the fence to prevent any uh, parking on the grass in the rear. Um, <clears throat> I just thought maybe it's worth noting that the rear yard setback variance would not be a rear yard, rear yard setback variance under our new zoning in the R1, um, and that uh, planning staff does agree with the professional plan <coughs> testimony provided by Mr. Height regarding um, the C variances and justifying them under the C1 and C2 criteria. Um, staff also finds that they will not have any detrimental impact to air, light, and space or detriment to the zoned plan. Um, and uh, this is an extremely um, <laughs> unique application. Um, oftentimes, internally, we discuss about how unit sizes are not conducive of you know, making families in Jersey City, and this is, uh, you could have a big family in this house. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's nice to see for a change. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's very unique, and um, planning staff thinks this certainly fills a void in the housing stock and um, achieves uh, unique objectives and goals of the master plan, and um, with that, planning staff recommends approval. Okay, thank you, Kim. Okay, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve case P23-070 with the added condition of the uh, fence uh, as presented to our board here tonight. Second. Okay, motion made and seconded for approval. Um, Vice Chair Dr. Gonzalez. Yeah, I, I, I think the variances are de minimis uh, and it meets the, the intent of the R1 district. Um, I do, I'm happy that we're removing that, that, uh, that garage. I think it will be uh, increased light in there uh, there so I would I Commissioner Gungadin yeah I, I conclude with um, Commissioner um, Dr. Gonzalez no detriment um, in regards to the variances and in line with our goals and um, objective our master plan definitely a great addition to the neighborhood very very unique love it I Commissioner Torres yeah I, I very nice job with that. I like the interior, the, what the secretary said, you know, um, larger homes like that, uh, more family oriented. And uh, I come from a large family. I know what that is to have your own bedroom, uh, basically. It wasn't easy. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I hope there's a lot of love in that house with the family, a big family. It'd be great. And um, I vote aye. Commissioner Dr. Desai. Yeah, it's a nice project, and I really liked it with a big, big family, as Doc, uh, uh, Mr. Torres said, and uh, it looks really good, and I vote aye. Commissioner Cruz? I vote aye. Commissioner Stamato? I vote aye. 
And Chairman Langston. Yeah, I agree. I think the, the variances uh, are de minimis. It meets the goals and objectives of the master plan. I, I mean, it, it's definitely different housing stock that we have, I believe, never seen. So, um, yeah, I'm going to vote aye. It's a good project. Motion carries all in favor with conditions. Okay. Thank you, Council. Thank you. All right, let's move on to item 13 is case P23-092. Is a preliminary and final major site plan for 612 to 616 Communipaw Avenue. Let's see if I can get this right this time. Okay, uh, for the record, Charles Harrington of Connell Foley on behalf of the applicant. Uh, I guess uh, before I begin procedurally, we did provide for um, did provide notice um, for the application, even though there are no deviations being requested. I ask that they be reviewed and marked into the record. I have a paper copy in the event you need a copy. Uh, I have copies. Hmm. I might have that in my file. I'm told I'm supposed to turn this mic on when I talk, Mr. Harrington. I mean, seriously, the circle of death on the surface is killing me, Chris. Keep hitting it. I am. I do. You need to do a uh, hot spot on your phone. You guys are asking a lot. That's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. <laughs> All right, it's Stay it's here. Me. <laughs> Yoga. It feels good always. Blue light, please. The cologne. <laughs> I only have the copies with me. I'm not sure if the originals were submitted to planning or not. All right. So I have the electronic copy. It's okay uh, on my screen. So I've had the opportunity to review it even before this evening because you were kind enough to send the electronic copy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it does appear to be in order. We can mark it as A1 for purposes of the record. And Mr. Harrington, I just ask that we double check with planning and make sure that we get the originals into the file and that. I think best practice moving forward now that we're all back in purpose is that we bring the originals the night of the hearing. And we make sure that we uh, we collect those. Thanks. Understood. All right. Thank you, Council. Okay. So I'll give an overview of, of um, the project. Uh, this property uh, is located in the Jackson Hill redevelopment plan area. It's a through lot uh, <clears throat> that fronts on Communipaw Avenue and Harrison Avenue. So um, it... Uh, you know, has you know a little of both. You have the kind of the residential on Harrison and, and your commercial on on Communipal, Although that porch portion of Harrison is is somewhat industrial, um, uh, if you if you ever you know go up that area, uh, the property is an oversized lot. It's uh, it's twelve thousand two hundred and fifty two square feet. Um, what we're proposing um, is a six story building with fifty nine residential uh, units, uh, five of which will be uh, affordable units in that one will be a moderate income unit and four will be workforce. Uh, the, uh, uh, the reason being is that one, uh, one unit is required to be affordable because of the sixth uh, floor as part of this project, uh, and that's the moderate income unit. Uh, the applicant is also, although not required, uh, proposing the four additional uh, workforce units as part of the project. And part of that is, is it's through an agreement with the Jersey City Redevelopment Agency um, as the, the applicant is has been designated as the redeveloper uh, by the Jersey City Redevelopment Agency. And he's in, as part of that agreement, he would be purchasing uh, the property from the JCRA. So this is something that has been presented and vetted, you know, to the, to the JCRA. Um, 
It also is providing for 27 parking spaces. And as uh, Mr. Lewis will take you through, the entrance uh, to the parking area would be from Harrison Avenue and not Communipaw, uh, because that is the, you know, the less uh, busier uh, street, if you will. Um, and I think, I, oh, the, and there's retail also on the ground floor. I don't know if I, that, that's going to be fronting on Communipaw. So um, it will be an infill. This is a, you know, a, a lot that has been vacant for some time. Uh, and it's something that my client is uh, hoping to, if approved, to, to move forward, you know, as soon as possible. And again, we're not asking for any deviations or variances, so it would be an, an as-of-right presentation that we're, we're presenting tonight, and that's, that's also as, as a result of working with uh, the planning staff uh, for some time. So with that said, I have um, our architect is Jeffrey Lewis um, to present the application. Uh, I also have our traffic engineer here. Uh, in the event uh, there are any questions for Mr. Lee Klein. Okay, thank you, Council. And Mr. Lewis, if you could just confirm for the record, you've already been sworn in tonight, you have been qualified and are still under oath. Yes, I remain under oath and qualified. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so just to um, add on to that uh, summary, uh, this is a through lot, as was mentioned, with frontages on Communipaw, Communipaw and Harrison Avenues. Uh, we are proposing a new six-story building with below-grade parking for 27 cars. Uh, the retail on the ground floor faces Communipaw, and it is 1,585 square feet. And we have a total of 59 residential units, and the breakdown of those are six studios, which average 543 square feet, 44 one-bedroom apartments that average 821 square feet, eight two-bedroom units that average 1,082 and a half <laughs> square feet, and there's one three-bedroom apartment, which is 1,252 square feet. Okay, so jumping right into it, I want to look at the site plan here. As I mentioned, we do have two street frontages. Communipaw is at the bottom, and Harrison Avenue is shown at the top. Um, each of these frontages are getting new concrete curbs, as well as new concrete sidewalks. We are proposing a total of six new street trees, three of them on each of the streets. Um, on Communipaw Avenue, we are actually setting back our building so that we can widen the sidewalk on Communipaw to the re required uh, 15 feet. Right now, it's a pretty narrow sidewalk, so we're going to be widening that to 15 feet. Um, the building itself is built, while we are set back from the front property line, we are built side, line, side lot line to side lot line. Um, on the Communipaw Avenue elevation, or street frontage, we access the main lobby to the building, as well as the commercial space. Uh, in the <laughs> center of the lot, we have two light wells that serve the residential units and serve as a uh, patio for the ground floor units. And then on the Harrison Avenue frontage, we have a second uh, residential entrance, and then the garage entrance. Here we're just showing that we are providing lighting along both street frontages as well as in the light wells. Here we're showing uh, the cellar plan on the left and the first floor plan to the right. I'm going to start in the cellar uh, at Harrison Avenue where cars would come into a 10-foot curb cut through the garage and down this 18-foot wide uh, ramp to the base to the cellar level. Here we have 27 total parking spaces. Uh, five of which are tandem parking spaces. Uh, we also have 36 bicycle parking spaces. 30 of them are at the end of the drive aisle, and then there's an additional six bicycle parking spaces near the elevators. Um, we also have our trash compactor room located on this level, so it's um, act, a shoot from above would bring all the trash down, and then it's easy to bring it right out to the street when it needs to get picked up. Um, we also, at the front near Communipal Avenue, have our main lobby for this level. There's the main stair here, as well as two elevators, all of our meters, uh, gas and electric, as well as our sprinkler room, as this will be a fully sprinkler building. And then in the front here, we have our stormwater detention tank. Uh, we do have a stormwater management system here. This is where the water will be stored. Uh, and then lastly, there is a second exit stair all the way at the end of the aisle, which brings you up to the first floor and then out of the building. That's, this is where that stair comes up, just to follow that out and leaves the building here or enters into the main building here. Uh, but going to the front of Communipal Avenue on the ground floor, that's where I really want to start. 
looking to the right, we do have a transformer room that we need for PSCNG. After that is that retail space. As I mentioned, it's 1,585 square feet. It also has its own ADA bathroom in it. Next, we have a fitness room for the building residents. This is 423 square feet and again has an ADA bathroom. And then lastly here, we do have the main lobby, which accesses uh, a parcel room, the main stair, and the two elevators. Um, besides that, uh, everything else on this floor would be residential. Um, as everything else in the building actually would be residential. I do want to mention first that all the apartments are ADA adaptable. They all have washer dryers in the apartments and they are all uh, have forced hot air for heat and air conditioning. On this floor, there are five apartments. Three of them are facing Harrison Avenue, two one bedrooms, and then a two bedroom, which has the second bedroom facing that light well. And then in the center of the building, there are two apartments. This is a two bedroom apartment and this is our single three bedroom apartment. And both of these apartments open out to those light wells, which are serving as patios for those apartments. They're each uh, 447 square feet of private patio space. Moving on to the second and third floor plan. These floor plans are actually both uh, the same. There are 12 units on each of the floor. Um, excuse me, 12 units per floor. Uh, there are four facing communipo on the front. Each of these has uh, their own balcony. Three of them are inset full balconies and one is a Juliet balcony. There are also four units facing Harrison Avenue. Two of them have balconies and two do not. And then there are four studio, four apartments in the center, uh, three studios and a one bedroom. And these each have balconies facing uh, the side in the light well. Um, again, of course, there are two stairs and two elevators connected with a common hallway. And then also there is a small trash and recycling room with that chute down to the compactor room. To the left here, we have floors four, five, and six. They are all the same as each other. There are 10 units per floor. Uh, both frontages of the building remain the same. So the same four apartments facing Harrison Avenue and facing Communipaw Avenue. The changes in the center of the building where we previously had four apartments and now we just have two, uh, two bedroom apartments. Uh, each of those, again, has their own single balcony. Uh, looking to the right at the roof deck, uh, this roof deck is served by both stairs and both elevators. Uh, we have a 600 square foot amenity space that has a closet and uh, ADA bathroom. This opens out to our uh, roof deck, which is a 3,478 square foot roof deck, which is set back over 20 feet from both street frontages. And we're using that space for our air conditioning condensers. This is our proposed front elevation. Well, this is the Communipaw Avenue elevation. Uh, our main building material at the lower two levels is a light gray cast stone. Above that cast stone, we're doing a red smooth brick for the upper levels as our main finish. And then at the insets of the balcony, we are using a light gray fiber cement siding. We're also using that same fiber cement siding uh, to provide accents for the windows here on the left, and you'll see this come up again. Um, after that, we have uh, black aluminum frame windows, black aluminum frames for the doors, and black aluminum railings at the balconies. Uh, and you can see on the ground floor, we do have a large glass openings facing Communipaw Ave for the residential space as well as the commercial space. However, it does get a little opaque at the end here where we have the transformer vault. Um, oh, we do have that rooftop amenity space. It is set back, so you're not going to really see it from the street. However, it's finished with um, an off-white stucco finish. And that'll be a, a smooth stucco. Here we're showing the Harrison Avenue elevation. Again, it's the same finishes where the bottom two floors are the light, cast, light gray cast stone red brick above, as well as the fiber cement uh, siding at the balcony infill, as well as the accents for the windows here on the left side. Um, I also do want to note we have a 10-foot wide garage door. This is a grooved metal panel garage door, again, to access that basement parking. This is the left side elevation. Uh, you can see the two sides that are on the property line and then the inset light well in the center where all the windows are and all of this would be finished in a, a gray fiber cement siding. 
And again, this is the same on the left side elevation where the entire elevation is finished in gray fiber cement siding. Um, that would include that would conclude my presentation. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lewis. And uh, two for two with no PTAC units tonight, I say. Always good to get rid of yeah, them, right? Yeah, no, I'm happy to see that. That's good. Um, <laughs> we should be headed that way. Um, the only question I really have is the area of refuge is in front of the elevators all the way at the end of that hallway. You're asking you building code questions, huh? Sure, why not? We mix it up here. Uh, yes, our area of refuge would be would be in the uh, area where the where the elevators are. Okay. Okay, that's it for me, Mr. Lewis. Anybody else? <coughs> Chair, I just have one question. There's 27 parking spaces. Yes. How will the parking spaces be assigned since there is uh, 59 units? I assume it would be first come, first serve, and they'd be rented out separately, but I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, no, I, I believe it would be first come, first serve. Um, there's only five required, um, so we are providing well in excess of, mm -hmm. of what's required, mm -hmm. but um, it would be an ownership decision, but most likely first come, first serve. Okay. But assigned, probably. And assi yeah, assigned. And on the parking, you were, I'm sorry to take your, uh, I don't know, I'm sorry, <laughs> since, it, okay. since she was on the parking, you, you said it was tandem parking. And if you go back to your par yep. parking diagram, um, yes. So how does, how's five. that going to work with those five in the those, front there? Those five would most likely, the two, the two spots would go to one apartment. Got you. And they, yeah. Okay. That's how it's usually done. Uh -huh. Or the, one of the bigger, perhaps the three bedrooms and the two bedrooms, most right. likely. That's my question. Okay, anybody else? Yes, um, so you're saying those five, five parking spots would be given to basically the same apartment? That's usually how it would be done, yes. Such a large building like this because to be exchanging keys is not going to... It's crazy. It's definitely not going to work on this one. Mm, but, I agree. Uh, okay, so that gives you... Basically, five less parking spaces. We so, so 22 of the apartments would be able to have their own, own right. parking spaces. Five right. would have two. Okay. There's this, we went with tandem parking. The, uh, f the balconies in the front of the building uh, on the commuter port side. Is there any chance of doing some type of safety uh, at the bottom? You have a four or five inch opening between your grills. And if you notice uh, with me, that's kind of a... Uh, Always been an issue. Yes. Okay. We, we can definitely add, add something, some sort of a mesh yeah. or something at the bottom yeah. to make sure nothing can go through. I don't I don't recommend putting a drain there because then you make a bathtub, right? And then you don't want that. Right. I guess the building. Um, so going with the balconies, though, on your left side elevation and your right side elevation, um, I, I like what you did with that. The lighting, you know, the well, the light well there. But um, the first floor, first floor. Yes. where the windows are there's no access to that area um, i'm sorry that's drawn it's shown as a window that i have to i'll fix that there should be a door out to that space for sure yeah there, that's going to be used as a terrace for that apartment so there should be, be used as be a, a terrace door. for that apartment correct so there okay. should be doors there that has to be changed I'm uh and is there a type of drainage system there for that because of the Yes, that will have to connect to the drainage system, which will go to the stormwater management system. And the same thing with the balconies. Anybody drops anything down and there's children playing down there. We can do, we can do it on all the balconies. We're going to wind up on the... Yes, sir. There. Okay. Last thing with that is I like the concept, but the I was over there today. Um, <laughs> the second floor, first floor, when they come outside, they have a wall of the building in front of them, right? <laughs> two builders on the two side. Builders, well, there's an empty lot next to us to the right. Okay. And to the left, there's a small one-story section, and then it's three stories. Yeah, it's three a one-story building. So they'll, yes. have that, they'll have that space. So they're going to know that there's a chance one day that somebody might want to build a building and cover all their windows. Well, yes, but they do have – it's a pretty big light, light well, but – Yes. It's a very big light well. well I agree. Yes, I anyone agree. Could, of course, anyone could knock down what it was a, It was a sad before. day at this board where we had to tell them, a building that there was somebody going to build in front of their kitchen patio. Yes, you know? I remember and that. And we couldn't. I remember that. And we couldn't say no to the project. It right. wasn't. It wasn't a good day for 
this board member yes. uh, to say that. Here, um, here 20 I, years from now. Mm -hmm. Well, even, even so, I do believe this light well is large enough. Where, it's large enough? Because it's like 14 by 25 or so. It's very big. Is there a way that when somebody rents a unit there, or I don't know if you're selling or renting, that they would know that there's a possibility that one day somebody could build something in front of their, their view? Is that, I mean, is that it is a selling work? point. I'll tell you the truth. Right now, the one over facing New York City side, mm -hmm. sit out there with a cup of coffee, you're good. You know? Right. Might if, not be like that every day. If, if you were going to do this as a condo uh, building, which I don't think that's the plan here, you would have to provide for that in a public offering statement. You would want to do that you so that to. somebody doesn't make, make that if objection it's a rental, later. Rental. You don't have to tell them anything. You don't, but I think, you know, I, I think a prospective tenant uh, would understand that that's a, uh, oper uh, that's a potential development there and that our, you know, our client would probably tell, tell them that because I hope that so. has, that area of Communipal has been built up. It went, you know, started on, on the corner of Communipal and Bergen and then has uh, slowly yes, gone, gone to, to the east. So I think there might be plans for the building, uh, the property adjacent to it already. Well, you know, it's just that when we built on a side, Yep. Right. And everybody thinks I'm going to have that forever, right. and that is not the case. And then this board can't say, "No, you're not." You know, we have to tell them you're not going to have that forever. Mm -hmm. It's not really a, yeah, they come a good position to be in. Their view. Yeah, it doesn't make for good neighbors. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. All right, thanks, Eddie. I didn't want to steal your thunder on that <laughs> that guess. balcony thing. I, I saw it. I knew I was you. In, I, we talked about it. I was going to skip it. But when I saw I the tandem it up parking, <laughs> when they threw a tandem parking with the balconies, it's like... No, if, if you skipped it, I would have brought it up then. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Your, your alley, right there. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you. So that completes our presentation. As I said earlier, I have our traffic engineer here as well in the event of any questions, but there are no variances, so there's no planning testimony tonight. Okay, thank you, Council. I do have... Um, one condition for you, and it, it's it's a common thing with uh, affordable units. You have five affordable units, um, just that those units will contain the same fit finish. There'll be no difference whatsoever between those units and the market rate units. Absolutely, and we would be uh, entering into a an affordable housing agreement with the Division of Affordable Housing. And that's in their agreement as well, correct? Yes, I believe that's one of the conditions from Mr. Ward uh, in his report, and in the event uh, it's voted on to be approved, we would agree with those conditions. Okay, understood. Thank you. All right, uh, at this point, is there anybody here from public that wants to comment on this application? Please come on up. Yes. I do. Charlene Burke, C H A R L E N E B U R K E, and it's 56 Duncan Avenue. Ms. Uh, Burke, good evening. Always a pleasure. We have three minutes for you. Good to see you in person, yes. too. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, may I just ask, what are the streets this is between on Communipur and Harrison? So it's between what? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ber Bergen Avenue, I believe, and uh, Monticello. Between Bergen and Monticello. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, a couple of things just noted. One, I'm, I would like to see a package room in the entry area, the lobby area, because of all the deliveries. And unfortunately, a lot of these buildings are victimized by thefts. And it tends to be once they get in, they go through everything. So a package room I would like to recommend for that entry, just for safety for the residents. Um, I appreciate the comment about covering up those those uh, um, alleyways or you know the spaces because eventually that will happen to the one level building. Um, Really, that was only the the only thing I wanted to mention about the package room because of the issues that are taking place all over Jersey City. Oh, and one other thing about the par bicycle parking. 
how does that how does that protect the upper levels, particularly with um, electric bikes? Are there covering or fire ratings so that it protects the? I know there's a lot of battery issues, so. Uh, Mr. Lewis can address those. Sorry. Hi. Uh, Ms. Burke, before. Oh, let me just. Is there uh, anything else before? Yes. Let you one go? other thing. How many ADA apartments are in here? I know you have first floor apartments, so yes. are they ADA compliant? And every, how many are they? So every apartment in the building is. In the, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, every apartment in the building is ADA adaptable, so all the apartments are ADA compliant. Mm -hmm. um, we do actually have a parcel room on the first floor, right here at the front, next to the lobby. So it's right when you come in, right to the left. This is our parcel room. Okay. It's about eight by twelve or so, so it's okay. a nice size. So we have that already. That is a good suggestion. And as far as the separation between the the basement parking and the first level, we do we are required to have a fire rating between any garage and living space. So there will be a two-hour rated ceiling there. Well, the concern is just about the bicycles because they will. Well, cars they, cars are just as bad. Trust uh, me. Uh, <laughs> Mm. But but they are we do have the two hour fire rated ceiling which is good very strong. Okay. Thank you. So Miss Burke, just for um, an FYI, the the bike battery problem is big. Okay. It's yeah it's um uh, they're they're going through fire codes right now, and there's there's no fire suppression system that will extinguish totally a, a bike battery fire of, you know, a decent size. So it's, you know, it, it's being looked at at the state level at this point and something will come out eventually, but it's just, it's not there yet. We can't require it yet, but it'll happen. It'll eventually happen. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else from public? Mr. Chair, I'd like to close your mic. Close the public. I move to close. Second. Okay. Motion is made and seconded. Public is closed. Matt, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, this project, uh, as proposed, has no variances. Um, they are, as testified, providing the requisite portable unit uh, in addition to doing some workforce housing uh, income restricted units as well. Uh, this is in the Jackson Hill redevelopment plan. Uh, which uh, which was adopted several years ago. This is a project that exemplifies what we're looking to see in this redevelopment plan. Uh, staff recommends approval. Okay, thank you, Matt. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion at this time to approve case P23-092 as presented to our board here tonight. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded mm -hmm. for approval. Vice Chair, Dr. Gonzalez. Did you want to say something? I'm sorry. Oh, just I just, oh, to? yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that the conditions in Mr. Ward's report and as noted by the chairman are, are part of the resolution. Yes. Um, yeah, I like the project. I, I think taking a, a lot and building this is going to be good there. Um, so I vote aye. Uh, Commissioner Gangadin. Yeah, I like this project, especially that there is five um, affordable units as well. This is a right away project, so my vote is yes. Uh, Commissioner Torres. Yeah, I also passed by that today, and I was um, with the affordable units. Um, there's certain things I already put on the record that I don't like, but with the affordable units and a lot that's been empty for so long, uh, just nothing really going on there. Um, I really like the project, so I vote aye. Commissioner Cruz. I vote aye. I'm sorry, Commissioner Stamato. I vote I. I like the project. I like the location. Um, I like the points that were raised by Mrs. Burke. Um, I just think that we should look at, you know, in the future, concentrate on, excuse me, <clears throat> electric cars and uh, the electric bikes. That's one concern that, that's been brought up um, in my case uh, that we had to deal with. But anyway, um, definitely for the project. Commissioner Dr. Desai. Yeah, the, that was a good question about the. Uh, that was a good question about. It's not. The light is on. Yeah. 
Is it working now? Okay. Uh, okay, that was a good question about the uh, e-bikes and everything. So many fires are going on, especially in New York, and they are going to pass something in New Jersey also. I just heard today. Uh, so that should be a future uh, concern about all the apartments, what they are going to do. But I vote I. And Chairman Lingston. Um, First of all, uh, Commissioner Torres, did you go to work today? <coughs> you just drive around all day looking. <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> um, anyway, I think it's a good project. It's as of right. I appreciate the, uh, the affordable units, you know, not being required but being built into the project. Um, so my vote is an easy aye. Motion carries uh, with conditions. Uh, as stated on the record and in the staff report. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Uh, so the time is 8.34. Mike, we usually take a break at 9. Take the... No, I think we should maybe take the break now and just go through the rest of the night, finish, uh, finish everything with no breaks. Uh, so we'll be back at uh, 8.40, everybody. Um, 10 minutes. 6 minutes. Can everybody, please? And let's call case P22-140 is a preliminary and final major site plan for 152 Ogden Street. Uh, this was carried from February 6th with preservation of notices and testimony taken on January 23rd. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, we are in public comment right now. So if anybody else from the public wishes to speak, Please come on up to the microphone. Can we just do some housekeeping first? I think sure. we do have some commissioners here that were Absolutely. at the last. In the meantime, mm -hmm. Yusef, don't be a stranger. You can come up. Is Mike? Um, hold on. Hold on. Everybody take me. <laughs> one step back. Uh, no, no, you're fine. You're fine. We just have to clear up a uh, deal housekeeping with the thing real quick. Voting members, please, Matt. Uh, the voting mem uh, the members at the last meeting were uh, Chairman Langston, uh, Vice Chair Dr. Gonzalez, uh, Commissioner Torres, Commissioner Gungadin, and Commissioner Cruz. I already read. You read the transcript? I read the transcript. Okay. Okay. So, Dr. Desai, you are eligible, and Commissioner Stamato? Yes, I've read the transcript. Okay, very good. You are also eligible then. To vote on the application. With that, Chairman, I think it's only appropriate. Uh, Mr. Harrington, do you want to put your representation on the record, please? Yes, again, for uh, Charles Harrington of Connell Foley um, on behalf of uh, the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Harrington. And Ms. Hagianis. Cynthia Hagianis on behalf of Riverview Neighborhood Association, and I also wanted to mention testimony was taken on November 28th in As addition well. to January 25th. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. With that said, public comments open. Yes. Thank you. Councilman, good evening. Um, we usually have a three-minute comment period. Uh, elected officials, our council members, we always afford extra time. But I'll try and respect your <laughs> time. Please thank be you. reasonable. I, I will be it. reasonable. Um, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, you know, my name is Councilman Youssef J. Soleil. I represent Ward D. That is comprised of the Heights and now downtown. Esteemed members of the planning board and members of the community, uh, I am here today to discuss 152 Ogden Avenue. And for a long time, I actually never really spoke at the planning board meetings because I respect you as a separate organ of government. And I know that it is a volunteer role and I really appreciate the public service that you do for our community. I listen in. You know, and I had to come today to add my voice to the chorus of voices here in the community behind me. Um, it is my understanding that this is an as-of-right application, 
And I understand that the planning board has to do what they're le legally obligated to do, but I do think that there are some loose ends that myself and the community are really concerned about regarding this development. I am not anti-development. I don't think the residents here are anti-development or anti-progress, uh, but it has to be done consistent with our values as a community. It has to be done consistent with uh, the concerns, the history, uh, the laws, and the community. And I'm here to voice my concerns on behalf of the community. Um, they are environmental and legal in nature. And the J.C. Heights community has uh, had major issues regarding water and sewage. And while the MUA is undergoing a massive revamp of our sewage system, right now it's combined and they're trying to separate them. Uh, separate it from uh, being combined to stormwater and then separate from the sewage. Um, having this uh, development is going to put further stress on our system. And it is a major development and should be classified as such. And the system is already overburdened. It's interconnected and it's similar to like if you have a blood clot in your leg and it travels to your brain. Like if you have so much stress in one area of the heights, like that leads to flooding in other areas of the heights. And what we have done, and I want to show evidence of that, is we have put a rain garden across the street from that development, I had no idea. This was over a year of planning. It's like, it took two years of planning to do on Wood Place and Ogden Avenue. You know, we put a, uh, it was actually a native plant garden and we've increased the curb bump out because we wanna make sure that, you know, not only are we educating people about native plants, but we're trying to retain more of that water. The Heights has strategic importance across Jersey City. Um, it is 100 feet above sea level. And essentially, when we have one of those really large storms, the heights, although it does flood, like we, we don't flood like Hoboken or downtown Jersey City. That's why we have OEM, the Office of Emergency Management, up on Summit Avenue. That's why Christ Hospital was the only hospital that was operational during Hurricane Sandy. So the heights is a really critical part of our city infrastructure when it comes to these once in a you know generation storms once every hundred years or 50 years now they're happening once every uh five years so we do have stormwater issues in the heights and i understand it is currently a surface lot and to add any more residents to that uh, would require a larger water retention system uh, than what is currently being proposed. Right now, it's only being proposed as a minor uh, development, so it would have to only conform to you know those water retention standards, but it is a major development. I call upon the developer, the MUA, and the planning board to make sure that this development is done in accordance with the laws set forth for major developments, which require larger water retention than what is currently being proposed. In fact, uh, I already spoke about the, uh, the native plant garden. Um, the community is also concerned with the development being so close to the cliff um, due to issues of soil erosion, uh, climate change. Um, this would be very catastrophic if you know, the, the building were to fall, <laughs> fall over the cliff. In fact, if you travel down Patterson Plank Road, you can see cracks in the, in the cliff and that is one of the things that keeps me up at night is you know are we going to make sure that that retaining wall and also the area by the cliff the whole integrity of the entire cliff is at stake um, and I don't want homes to collapse there so if there's a way to mitigate that or put it further from the cliff that would be uh, fantastic as a representative for Ward D, representing this area, I, I ask you to mitigate these concerns, have the developer work in good faith with the community, and um, if they cannot address these legal and environmental concerns, uh, to deny this application. And just because you can build something doesn't mean that you should build something. I mean, anything that is built there would be better than what is currently a surface lot, right? But we need to be responsible <laughs> with our development and the 
the decision you make today will reverberate for a really long time. So I ask you to apply the major development standards for the water retention purposes. And uh, the community is near unanimous in their opposition to this. Um, so I really hope that the planning board does uh, does us justice by either delaying or denying this application. Um, thank you so much. And I appreciate your time. I appreciate your community service. I respect the decision that you make ultimately. And I thank you for giving me this platform. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Youssef, let's not stop at that one bioswale, all right? Okay. Let's make more happen. Please, anybody else, come on up. <clears throat> yes, I do. Uh, Mark Miltner, Mark with a K, M I L T N E R. I'm at 154 Ogden. Good evening, sir. Are you a member of the RNA? No, I am not. Okay, thank you. And we have three minutes for you then. Thank you. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, water retention right there. Uh, am I allowed to ask a quick question of the board or no? Not really. Then I won't. It just has to do with water retention and is it a major project in your opinion? That's all. We're, so let me pause your time. So our opinion is whatever the law is. It's, it can't be based on opinion, it's based on law. So that would be my answer to that question if it was asked. And don't worry, we'll explore. We'll explore it still. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, uh, this isn't gonna be as glamorous as some people who can present, but I'll do my best. Uh, the proposed development at 152 Ogden threatens not only the established character of this tree, but also in some visceral way, the real identity of our community. Uh, 154 Ogden, that's where I live, uh, known as Pullman's Hall and a cornerstone of our neighborhood for 150 years, uh, risks being overshadowed and diminished by the sheer scale of the proposed building. We urge the developer to reconsider the sheer height and mass reflected in the plan and to ensure Pullman's Hall remains a celebrated um, landmark. Preserving cultural neighborhoods like ours lies at the heart of New Jersey's heritage. Where am I going with this? The existing historic preservation law, is that Peapod? Um, I wanna make sure I get everything right, offers a framework, but tighter regulations are essential to ensure new developments respect our collective <coughs> history and community identity. Despite the project at 152 Ogden's uh, claim of as of right, is that the term? Um, it disregards several key principles outlined in Jersey City's residential design standards. The initial zoning map granting R2 uh, designation on this lot amidst a predominantly R1 Ogden Avenue should really be scrutinized. But that's not on the people that are wanting to build, that's more like on our city, uh, us. We should probably scrutinize that more. The proposed 95 foot structure, even with a partial uh, 63 foot setback, dwarfs surrounding buildings and clashes fundamentally with the neighborhood's character, not to mention stealing practically all of everyone's afternoon sunshine. This directly contradicts residential design standard point C, emphasizing compatible mass, scale, height, and proportions to existing streetscapes. Notching the building back around 30 feet where it faces the street before rising up to its full eight-story height doesn't seem to do much at all, opinion. Uh, in the end, those two additional stories will have noticeably negative impact on the birds and trees and daylight as well. All this not to mention the general neighborhood look itself. Additionally, point B mandates, this is of the same, I don't know if it's an ordinance, uh, mandates uh, roof lines adhering to block or neighborhood patterns, which this design clearly fails to achieve. Current proposal not only disregards established design principles, but also threatens the unique charm and character of Ogden Avenue. A thorough reevaluation of the zoning designation and a significant redesign adhering to the residential design standards are crucial to protect the community's architectural heritage and future, in my opinion, and many others. Thank you, sir. That was your three minutes. Thanks. Appreciate it.
please come on up. Don't be shy, everybody. Just come uh, on right up. Hi. <laughs> of course. Yes, sir, I do. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Diana Sarmiento, S A R M I E N T O, 154 Ogden Avenue, apartment 3F. Good evening, ma'am. Are you Good a member evening. of the RNA? No, sir, I'm not. Okay. Surprised you should be if you live on Ogden there, right? <laughs> I think we're going to have to be. <laughs> I have been an owner and resident of 154 Ogden Avenue in a beautiful and historic 150-year-old building on a quaint little street for over 30 years. On a very personal note, the proposed towering modern structure will sit directly across from my living room windows. Now, I know you can't just take that into consideration. I know you've seen a 1,000 photographs. But this is what I look at right now, which will be gone. Um, my living room, sorry. And will absolutely result in my losing natural light and view from my home. On a general note, it just doesn't fit our little street. I'm concerned the construction itself will disrupt our peace and surely affect our quality of life. I'm worried about the added congestion and traffic to our quiet little street. But I will close with this. All the logical vital points raised by my eloquent neighbor, Mark, and the gentleman, goes for me too. Thank you. Can I see that picture? Can I, am I allowed to see that? It's, uh, no, it's not evident. Oh, okay. I do. <clears throat> uh, it's Manya, M O N Y A, McCarty, M C C A R T Y. And my address is 411 Fairmount Avenue, Jersey City. Okay. Good evening, ma'am. Obviously, you're not a, an RNA member. But I was <laughs> for okay. about 15 years. Okay. So, anyway, so I kind uh, of have three a. Three minutes for you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a foot in both worlds, kind of. So, um, and I know you've heard the concerns of um, the residents and that of the engineer of the last meeting, and I endorse those concerns, especially those of safety. Um, I moved to Ogden Avenue, my husband and I, in 2001, so that was the year that this was codified by the city council. Um, and I lived next door to the collapse where you've seen the photograph of that dramatic collapse. So it's very real. And when the, the large project was being done, the book bindery below us was being done, everybody had to empty their basements. There were lots of before pictures of what was there because they didn't know what was gonna happen. And they, you know, as you know, they put up all of that, um, the screening you know, that heavy duty screening against the cliff there. I hope you know what I'm talking about, I'm sure you do. So anyway, so these concerns are very real and, and I think they're <coughs> not entirely predictable. So, um, but that's more than I wanted to say. Hold on one second. Um, so, um, so as I said, I'm, I'm not an immediate neighbor, but I was, and, um, but I'm here as a Jersey City resident. And I'm here because the Palisade Cliffs are a unique geographic asset to our area, much like how Liberty State Park is a unique asset to our area, our state and beyond. Um, you only have to visit Riverview Park to understand the impact of the cliffs, whose views echo those of the same cliffs in Hamilton Park up in Weehawken and, and also beyond. The, the views are unique and breathtaking. Such natural assets are ours to enjoy locally, but also ours to protect. 23 years ago, the Jersey City City Council did just that by endorsing and passing the Palisade Protection Overlay District, also known as the Peapod. And at that time, I did live on Ogden Avenue, and I was there for 15 more years, um, and I was a member of RNA. Uh, I was, and I am still close friends with one of the main authors of the Peapod. I know what his and the City Council's concern and intent was when they added the Peapod to the Jersey City zoning map. Uh, many legal instruments can be picked at, watered down, and ultimately be made fully ineffective by folks with a different agenda. Um, but I know that you as a board are not permitted to legislate zoning, and that, um, and that might cause um, you some personal conflict sometimes. I hear that too. But I understand that is your role, to adhere, adhere to zoning. So like others, I understand that. Uh, but with your decision tonight, you can uphold the existing zoning 
and prevent the precedent that will, over time, undo the intent of concerned citizens across the city and its intent that our city council voted to codify 23 years ago. So thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your time. <clears throat> Yes. Sam Pesson, P E S I N, 580 Jersey Avenue, apartment 3L. Mr. Pesson, good evening. You're not a an RNA member, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. We have three minutes for you, sir. I'm speaking for myself, but I'm president of the Friends of Liberty Park. I grew up in Greenville, but my roots are in the Heights. When my grandparents came from Russia, they raised their family on Palisade Avenue. I'm named after my Uncle Sam, the Heights Assemblyman in the 1930s on Mayor Haig's ticket. My father, Morris, is the father of Liberty Park. He envisioned turning the abandoned waterfront into a free park and led the movement along with Ted Conrad and Orby Zapp to create the park and fought battles against privatization. Ted Conrad, the famous architectural model builder and historic preservation legend, saved the Lowe's Theater and the Brennan Courthouse from demolition. Ted lived at 248 Ogden Avenue, built in 1760, and the former home of New Jersey's fifth governor, Aaron Ogden. I'm sure that Ted Conrad would oppose this project. This application, if approved, would have negative environmental impacts that would affect not only the direct neighbors in the Heights, but those of us who are concerned about protecting natural resources, like the Palisades Cliff and the Hudson River watershed. While this is one lot, approving an application that does not follow Jersey City's stringent storm water control ordinance would set a very bad precedent. And allowing developers to build so close to the cliff's edge can cause harm to the Palisade Cliffs, a geological wonder, by increasing the chance for rock slides and erosion. The proposed eight-story building is out of scale and does not fit the character of Ogden Avenue. You should trust the expertise of greatly respected Princeton Hydro, who had given you testimony in deciding to oppose this project. Princeton Hydro has been working with the DEP and Army Corps to plan Liberty Park's spectacular 165-acre interior nature habitats, which includes freshwater and saltwater or wetlands. I strongly support the neighbors in the Heights, including the 40-year-old inspiring dedicated Riverview Neighborhood Association, and I urge this board to vote to deny it. Please listen to the community, as Councilman Soleil so passionately stated, and please prioritize the public interest. Thank you. Hi, good evening, Chelsea Plaza. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I do. Sure. Chelsea, C H E L S E A, last name Plesnitzer, P L E S N I T Z E R. I live at 33 Griffith Street, um, very close to Ogden. Um, I'm not a member of RNA. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we have three minutes for you. Yeah, sure. I'll be quick. Um, so I'm also here representing a newly formed group of JC Heights parents and moms uh, that this time is really difficult to meet in person. But um, you know, this building does not fit the character of the neighborhood. I'm very concerned about that. It just, if you walk down the block, there's quaint homes. This is not that. Um, personally, um, living at 33 Griffith, two times now we've experienced storm water coming up and we are on the third floor. Um, coming up through our bathrooms and damaging floors and things like that. Uh, behind our unit uh, is the lumber house, so that was new development. And we have new construction across the street that's been a disaster. Um, and we've had um, our sewers back up from that as well. There's no way to prove it, but it's happened. Um, and it was an expensive project, so I'm particularly concerned about that. Um, and the system not being able to support a building like that uh, and then also the degradation of the Palisades Cliffs, which is, has been seen <clears throat> by everyone else. So that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We appreciate it. <clears throat> I, 
I do. It's Elvin Dominici, E-L-V-I-N-D-O-M-I-N-I-C-I, One Congress Street in the Heights. I'm not a member. Okay, thank you. We have three minutes However, for you. I do support the NRA with what they're trying to do. Uh, good evening, uh, commissioners. I truly appreciate the work that you do. Uh, I understand that you need to uh, take the facts and the different situations with this project, but as a person that lives in the neighborhood, that have to commute uh, to the park and, and the area with my kids and my family, uh, it's highly concerning to know that this property is going to be way above the three or four units that is allowing this zoning, even though I guess they are to change it, but something that is complete out of the structure, like the lady was saying, the other people that were talking here. So my main concern here is to make sure that this is a safety issue, make sure that the building is not too close to the cliff, because I also commute on Patterson Plant Road, so I also taking a risk, me and my family, to, <clears throat> to be in an accident because of the location of this property. And if, when you see a community coming together, uh, raising their voices, united, because they're highly concerned about a property, um, I think uh, our job, uh, your job as a public servant is to take the facts, but also listen to the community. Because here there is something that a group of people from Jersey City who are taxpayers, who are very concerned with our community, they want to make sure that their families, their kids, and everybody's safe. What I can say about me and the situation in the property that I live in, I live in one Congress, is very close to the corner between Congress and Ogden, and we have a retaining wall. Now we have an issue where the owners have to come up with money. We're working on it in order to repair the wall because it's also at risk of collapsing. What I'm saying is, regardless of the situation, uh, we gotta <clears throat> make sure that our neighborhood is safe, so we avoid to having an accident or losing a life in the future. Let's put that first. Thank you. Yes. Yes, Abigail Schmelzer, uh, last name S-C-H, M as in Mary, E-L, Z as in Zebra, E-R. Uh, and I live at 140 Ogden Avenue, and I'm not a member of the RNA. Sorry, I'm sick, yeah. so. <laughs> That's okay. Um, we have three minutes for you. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so I've lived next to the proposed project site for the past eight years, um, and I adore my community and the neighborhood, and am happy to call it my home. Um, I echo a lot of the concerns and challenges that have been raised by a lot of previous public testimony, but also uh, a lot of the folks who have spoken tonight. Um, I do want to reiterate what many others have, that my number one concern of this project is safety, um, especially for those of us who live so close to this build site. So I'm, I'm right next door. Um, the driveway will be butting right up against my driveway. Um, and so, yeah, I think a couple things to that point. The intersection at, right there at Ogden and Wood is already extremely congested. Um, just today, actually, I noticed... Um, somebody illegally parked blocking the crosswalk, um, and that would actually be right, I guess, blocking the, the proposed driveway and then also, like, butting into our driveway as well. Um, I think that for such a large-scale project that's unprecedented, I'm looking for safety precautions. Um, I'm very concerned about the instability of, about any instability in the cliff, um, and any unforeseen damage that may come from a project like this. I think the second major issue for me is the, the rainwater, the storm, I don't know the right terms, so sorry. Um, the stormwater plans for this development. Um, it was less than two years ago, I wanna say, that there was a major storm and we had backed up water. It was just falling too fast for the systems to um, process it, I guess, sorry. Um, so we had water, rainwater backing up, and it was actually um, coming into the basement for both of the bottom units at 140 Ogden. Again, that's right next door. Um, so although we live on a cliff, we're not immune to flooding and water issues. And so I really I, I ask that this be considered a major project um, and that the stormwater plans be handled appropriately. Um, I ask that the board please deny this application at this time. Thank you for hearing me out, and thank you to the councilman for speaking on behalf of those who couldn't be here tonight. Thank you. We appreciate it.
I do. Lynn Mullins, 356 Webster. Ms. Did Mullins, you know? good evening. Uh, no. Are you a member of RNA? No. Okay, thank you. We have three minutes for you. Did you know that the Palisades are a national and natural landmark and the most dramatic geologic feature in the New York area? Most of us don't think much about what history our houses are built on. The basalt cliffs that we are talking about tonight is roughly 200 million years old. Our palisades appear on the first European map of the New World drawn in 1541. In November of 1776, George Washington stood on the palisades and watched as the British captured Fort Washington across the Hudson. Only the Hudson River and the steep cliffs stood between the British and what was left of his Continental Army. Many of the houses surrounding this plot are history themselves, 150 to 200 years old. Neighbors live in two- and three-story dwellings made mostly of brick and wood. Once upon a time, men walked to local factory jobs and women climbed stone steps wearing long Victorian dresses. Planning for Jersey City's future includes considering the past. Erasing our past for monetary gain of development is not always good planning. This proposed building would dwarf the two adjacent buildings that are over 100 years old. Towering over Hoboken, this massive glass structure would be in the flight path of thousands of birds who migrate through and reside along the Hudson. New Jersey has no legislation requiring bird-safe glass, leaving that higher-priced option up to the developer. From what we have seen so far, this project cares little for adapting to the neighborhood or to our natural habitat. Tonight's hearing has been delayed several times due to a lack of geological testing information. To imagine considering an eight-story building on a sloping cliff without first making sure that the cliff can handle it sounds like shoddy business. In May 2012, a 10,000-ton rockfall occurred just south of the New York line and left a 520-foot scar on the Palisades. North Bergen has had two rock slides in December. This sloping ancient cliff can't handle this massive structure. This building is too big for the precarious lot, and it doesn't fit in with the neighborhood. Please deny this application. I oppose it for safety reasons and its disregard of residential design standards 345.62. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Yes, Lauren Morris, last name M-O-R-S-E, and I'm at 63 Sherman Place. I am formerly of 121 Ogden as well, and I'm not a member of the RNA. Okay, thank you, and we have three minutes for you. Absolutely. Thank you all for your time and attention. We really appreciate it. Um, I would like to say that as a former resident of Ogden Ave and someone who is still living in the Heights, I volunteer a lot at locations near the proposed development like the rain garden the councilman mentioned earlier, Ogden Zen Community Garden, and we do get wildlife like hummingbirds through there and really incredible place to take our youth and to build community. So in addition to my concerns about window strikes, as the prior speaker noted, I would really just encourage you to please deny this application because this development is unsafe. Approving it simply puts our neighborhood homes and lives at risk. It's too close to the cliff. It's risking erosion and collapse that would destabilize a whole area. And you can get cascading effects like that. And once it starts, it might not be controllable. This development simply does not meet the standards to address flooding. New Jersey is one of the fastest forming states in the country. And our rainfall is expected to increase from about 52 inches a year to 62 inches a year. And that total is likely to be even greater in northern New Jersey. That accumulated volume of water coming in more and more intense storm events many of which we have already experienced, um, must be dealt with. And we have a way to deal with that. We have this floodwater ordinance. This development, however, by not being held accountable to the major development stormwater management plan, which I hope it will be um, by the planning board, really weakens our ability to deal with this urgent and ongoing issue in the Heights and really in all of Jersey City. The data I mentioned above is sourced from Cornell University, the New Jersey DEP, and the federal agency NOAA. The DEP commissioner stated, we can take the wise steps that the science demands, from planning more resilient development to enhancing our stormwater and flood control infrastructure and beyond. I'm someone who works on that flood control infrastructure with the rain gardens, but we are already seeing that inundated during normal rain events, and now we're talking about adding more impermeable service that doesn't meet the floodwater management plan. So that's deeply concerning to me. So I really hope that our city would 
pass ordinances that then we expect developers to meet, especially ones as critical as managing flood waters. The area near this development again struggles with standing water during storms and flooding in basements and ground level units. I'm also sure the city of Hoboken would appreciate us making sure we're managing um, our flood waters as we are supposed to be. So again, this project endangers the integrity of the landscape, which has already been shown to be vulnerable to collapse. I believe that the board will make sure that they put their names and put their stamp of approval only on an accurate, safe application that identifies this as a major <coughs> development um, in terms of the stormwater plan. We really need to make sure that applications honor ordinances and protective overlays that people really believed in and they meant to be followed. So again, I really hope that you would deny this application because of safety concerns and because it is simply not in the character of the neighborhood. The building design will not fit in. Um, personally, I find it quite garish with the, the way it looks and we can all kind of see that as we go down Ogden Avenue. So we really hope you fulfill your duty to protect our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. I do. Jessica Caro and 65 Fleet Street of my address, formerly 226 Ogden Avenue. Good not evening, a member of the... Okay, thank you. <laughs> and uh, we have three minutes for you. Sure. So um, I grew up on that block, actually, born and raised. My mother still lives at 226 Ogden, one of the only uh, rent control buildings still available there. Um, you know, it's always been my dream to move back to Ogden and it's really, you know, I would love to invest and buy a property there, but it's really difficult because there's really no properties ever available. And if they are now, it's, a, a, you know, millions, right? At the same time, you know, I hear a lot of people complaining about things where the structure of the building is different. It doesn't match. I just don't see how that's any different than downtown. We have historic brownstones and you have a bunch of new construction standing next to brownstones. <coughs> You know, I think it's absolutely fair that the safety is important. Obviously, we don't want something built that's going to be falling off a cliff or causing deaths. But we have three parking lots there. You're on a cliff and you have two other ones on the other side. There's plenty of space there to build something new and beautiful. And it doesn't have to be old or, or matching the other houses because that's what new developments do. And it brings an opportunity for people to buy a, a condo there and, you know, be able to move back. The other thing I'm seeing here is that they have 14 parking spots for 14 units. So at least they're trying with the 14 parking spots. They're also talking about not having any variances. You know, the massive structure of it and the safety, I would presume that that would be looked into. When it comes to the flooding, obviously that's an issue as well. But I know that when Ida happened, it flooded even on 65 Fleet Street. It flooded everywhere. So I don't know if that's what's being talked about, but obviously looking into the safety of this is going to be key, but building something there, I think is needed. We don't need three parking spots to be looking at right there in that area. Something nice should be put there. Now, do they need to do these safety measures? Obviously, yes, and I would presume before building anything that that gets done. And, you know, whatever needs to be done with a water retention, obviously that that be done as well. But what I'm hearing a lot from people is really just blocking of sunlight and the facade of the building not matching. And I, to that I say, we see that all over downtown now. So I really don't see how that's any different. That being said, I know I'm not going to get a round of applause, but thank you so much for allowing me to speak. <laughs> and those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. <laughs> Yes, I do. My name is David Wallace, D-A-V-I-D-L-A-W-L-E-S-S. -S. I'm the owner and occupier of 170 Ogden Avenue, which is four, four doors down from the proposed construction. Good evening, sir. Are you a member of RNA? I am not. Okay. We have three minutes for you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the house I am, I'm, I'm living in, it actually, I'm the second owner of this house in 100 years. Uh, Marie Tuzo, who is a well-known um, fixture of the neighborhood, owned it prior that to me. And before her, I think her family owned it uh, since it was built in 1924, if I understand correctly. Um, first, I, I agree with all of the technical concerns and objections that have been raised by the RNA and other opponents to the project, um, but especially with regard to the overloading of the local sewer, local sewer system. I lived, in, uh, I lived at 159 Ogden Avenue across the street from 2009 to 2013. Uh, 
2012. And um, experienced flooding on a frequent and extensive basis. There's no doubt that there's a problem there with uh, water drainage. And not, just during, not just during the hurricanes, it happened all the time. Um, it's a single commercial lot stuck in the middle of a residential road. It's rather odd in this regard. And the building, um, you know, I, I basically object to this on, on aesthetic grounds very strongly. The building is absurdly twice the height of the next tallest building in the vicinity. It's just, and it's an ugly glass tower. I, I just really, I can't say that uh, I have any fondness for this at all. Uh, let's see, just, uh, oh yeah, she mentioned that there was a, there's a building a couple f doors further down that's now I think f like three stories tall. And at one point it was built to four stories tall and outside of the zoning uh, for that lot, which apparently is strange that each of these lots can be zoned in a very different way. They actually were required to remove the top floor of the building as a result of an RNA, um, a lawsuit in action. So that's, uh, I think, uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, and this project is gonna, gonna create a disaster for about a year. The, co the construction will be a nightmare. It'll, it'll you know, be disturbing to our lives. It'll be ex extreme traffic. You know, I've lived through this a couple times already and it's, it's getting quite old. So I oppose it on the grounds of that as well. And it's gonna increase the level of traffic on the street, which is already at a problematic level. Thank you, those are my thoughts. Thank you, we appreciate it. I do. William Colon, 157 Ogden Avenue. Good evening, Mr. Colon. Are you a member of the uh, RNA? No, I'm not. Okay, thank you. We have three minutes for you. Okay. All I want to say is that I've been living there since 1983. I bought this house. Uh, back in the 80s, they built a nursing home <clears throat> in my house. That got damaged with the dynamiting and so forth of the rock. So my concern is what's going to happen now when I'm only 150 feet away from what this building is proposed to be built. I'd like to get some guarantees on my house. And that's about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um... I do. My name is Daniel Haig, H-A-A-G, and I live at 159 Ogden, um, right Good next evening, to... Sir. Oh, I am not a member of the RNA. Okay. Uh, RNA needs to do better outreach, it sounds like. <laughs> Everybody on Ogden, I, I thought they were all RNA members. But. I work with them on a music festival that takes place up there, though, every year. Okay. Understood. Um, so we have three minutes for you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I want to echo with what my neighbor, William, said. He's, he's lived in that house since the 70s. I lived, lived in mine since 2012. He's raised three generations of his family there. I'm raising my first. Um, we both live in old wooden houses you know, single family homes, uh, two stories, that's it, and a basement. And as David mentioned, my basement does flood. Um, we've taken remediation, uh, extensive remedia remediation steps to dig down, retar, redo everything around the basement. I mean, I, I've meticulously uh, brought this house back to life pretty much. Um, new roof, new everything. And I, I'm concerned about what this development is gonna do to mine and Williams Foundations. Um, as he mentioned, when the health center was built, it's about 300 yards from his house. It cracked his foundation, it cracked his walls. Um, this is 150 feet from our houses, and we're very concerned with what this construction is going to do. Um, I don't think there's been enough testing as to where the Palisades lie, as to when they're dug into, what it's gonna, how it's going to affect the houses around it. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I don't think anybody in this room is really against development. We're against this development, this height this scale, this, the lack of safety that's been, looked, that, that's been put forth. And you know, I hope that at this time you guys deny this application. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Appreciate it. I do. Andy Herrera, 118 Ogden Avenue, H-E-R-R-E-R-A. I am not a member of RNA. Thank you, sir. We have three minutes for you. So, as everyone's been speaking of tonight, <laughs> safety is a main concern. Non-conforming to our neighborhood, yeah, definitely not conforming. Double the size of most of the properties in the area. My major concern is the sidewalks, the driveways. There's gonna be two driveways butt up next to each other. 
cr essentially creating a two-way street on a sidewalk. There's two parks, north and south of this project. Children riding their bicycles, running, scooters, walking down the street may be injured here. Safety is the biggest concern here. I'd urge the board to urge to err on the side of safety and deny this application. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Elizabeth Dempsey, DEMPSEY, 154 Ogden Avenue. I have been a resident there for 21 years. I've obviously seen the block change quite a bit. Um, I have my own business. I walk dogs on this block all day long. I have a 15 year old who uh, I used to go to Hoboken to find other mothers. There are now a slew of children on this block going down to the dead end street. I have to echo everything that's been said here as far as safety. I know nothing about rainwater, but I can testify to the fact that our building has flooded. I live, uh, my personal bedroom is the f basement of this building. <clears throat> I've seen water come up. I don't think it's just when there's Sandy and Ida. It has to do with a lot of water at a lot of time. Um, I also just, it, you know, the safety is a big concern. I'm not against development. I, you know, certainly something maybe could go there, but twice the size of our building. Uh, lack of sunlight, sure, maybe we, you know, I, according to somebody in the room, they want us to just get a tissue out and wipe our tears. But I will have no more light in my house. I have one window. So yes, personally, I don't love that. If it was to scale with the neighborhood, I could probably, you know, be swayed into agreeing with something like that. But as it stands, I, I just don't see how it'll fit in. And yes, I do have blue sky and some birds to listen to now, but I think all of that will be gone. I don't have the expertise of the people who got up and spoke about migration of birds and wildlife, but we should be thinking about other things other than people moving from Manhattan to live next door who will have no appreciation for this neighborhood, no appreciation for uh, what goes on in this area. And uh, it's not people that are thinking they're going to live on the block again. It's a lot of money to live on the block. And I just hope that people can respect the fact that we have a, a cliff to protect. And, and just there's just so many things. I know they've all been presented to you. And I just hope that you take them all into account. Thank you for Thank your you. time. I do. Yep, Anthony Harrington, H-A-R-R-I-N-G-T-O-N, and my address is 74 Jefferson Avenue. Good evening, sir, and are you a member of RNA? Uh, no, but I'm the secretary of Sergeant Anthony Park Neighborhood Association. Okay, um, thank so you. I'm, three minutes for you. Yep, thank you. Um, I don't live that far away. Thank you, commissioners, by the way. Um, I don't live that far away from this project. Um, the members of Sergeant Anthony Park Neighborhood Association share a concern about development along the Palisades. Um, we'll I'll be back. Um, Next week, they'll talk about another project that will be a 10-story proposed project on Palisade Avenue. I have great respect for Mr. Harrington and Mr. Vandermark. They've met with us many times for projects in our neighborhood, but we do have concerns about overdevelopment in the Heights. Um, and I'm here to lend my support to our name. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, my name is Frauke Riller, last name is Riller, R-I-L-L-E-R, -L -L and I live on 154 Ogden Avenue. I'm one of the uh, owners. Good evening, ma'am. Good are evening. Are you an RNA member? No, but very committed to the, the beauty of our little garden and everything else that contributes to the harmony of this very Understood. So we have three street. minutes for you. Otherwise, the mayor of Jersey City might not have chosen this wonderful street. It really is unique. And uh, as you heard from uh, all the people here, it's a, a very harmonious and strong, tight community. I just wanted to share with you that last Saturday, um, a lot of owners of our, uh, our building, apartment owners, <coughs> we um, are collecting bids right now from contractors to fix leaks of the roof and lots of holes in our brick wall. And three contractors apparently warned us that 
We can't put up foldings here. We can't hang them. We can't hurt them. You're, you're about to roll down the hill, which is not very uh, comforting as an owner of an apartment. But if you ever look at the back side of our building, it's really not looking very encouraging. I just want to uh, share with you that uh, it would make me very sad if this building went up because I try to, I always try to look at both sides in situations. I work in conflict zones and we sometimes have to write the victory speech of our opponent to understand the other side. So I'm not against development. I'm not against, you know, beautiful new architecture being inserted in older neighborhoods. But I tried to write the victory speech and it was very, very hard. But I do appreciate all the work and the design elements and everything that goes into a project like this by the architect, by the developer. And I would like to beseech the developer and the architect, please find another lot where you can show your metal, where you can share your skills mm -hmm. and, and implement your vision. But in this particular situation, I would say, please, could you refrain? Thank you very much. Thank you. I do. Yes, Lisa Blando, last name B-L-A-N-D-O, and I'm at 185 Webster Avenue. Great. Ms. Blando, good evening. Good evening. RNA member? Not currently. Okay, thank you. We have three um, minutes for you. Th thank you so much for all this time. Um, I, I moved to Jersey City Heights because it was affordable. I stayed because I love the neighborhood -y vibe. I, I really strongly feel that this project is bad for the Heights and it sets a, a dangerous precedent. Practically speaking, I also am quite concerned about infrastructure, um, traffic already a bummer, um, parking a bummer, capacity of, um, uh, of uh, the buses at uh, uh, rush hour, a bummer. Um, aesthetically speaking, um, big shiny buildings are also way out of character for our little neighborhoody neighborhood. And not to mention, as people have been saying, the Heights is well known for its views. And so a lot of people can kiss those views goodbye and probably kiss a lot of uh, market value in their homes goodbye when those views are gone. Um, outside of the confines of our neighborhood. Uh, clearly, I also share a lot of concerns about the structure and maintaining the Palisades, but also as cool as it would be to say that we have waterfront property, I am sure Hoboken would really not appreciate uh, the, 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 the water management issue. Um, so all that being said, I, like everyone else, say let's not do 152. Thank you. Yes, I do. Yes, my name is Colin Egan, C-O-L-I-N, last name E-G-A-N. I live at 35 Sherman Place in the Heights, and I am not now, nor have I ever been, a member of RNA. So. Good evening, sir. We have three minutes for you. Thank you. And I just want to thank uh, all the commissioners here for coming out. Um, it's, it's a great thing you do. We do it every other Tuesday. You're welcome any night. <laughs> That's why I particularly admire you guys, because you're doing every Tuesday when I'm at home. So anyway, um, the least important thing I have to say to you uh, about this project is my personal reaction to it, based on my understanding of streetscape and scale and Jersey City character, was when I saw the building, really? For Ogden Avenue? I don't think it's a good fit. And frankly, I think that the builders the designers would propose it, show that they're not really planning on being very good neighbors. But much more importantly than my opinion, um, I've worked in Jersey City mostly about preservation and quality of uh, life issues. Some of you may know the Lowe's Jersey Theater at Journal Square for the better part of four decades. And in that time, I've gotten to know and work with many of the neighborhood associations Jersey City is extremely fortunate to have. And RNA is, has always been one of the best. Uh, Sam Pezen mentioned Ted Conrad, who worked with me, I worked with him, I should say, at the beginning of the Lowe's Project. He's a founder of RNA. And the thing about RNA is they have people who have, and 
over the years, this has never changed, extraordinary understanding of concern for all the issues, frankly, you folks deal with in terms of environmental concerns, streetscape, uh, light, air, and quality of life. When RNA is states an opinion, it's worth listening to, and I've listened to their opinion on this project, and I agree with all of it. Um, they're right, this is not a good project for this space. But what they have brought out and what is before the commission tonight is the fact that there is a very specific issue that is very much in your purview, that is the, the stormwater, environmental issues, and also the safety issues. And based on those, I would recommend that you deny this project. Thank you. Yes, I do. Yes, Paul Amatuzzo. P-A-U-L-A-M-A-T-U-Z-Z-O, 83 Sherman Place, Jersey City Heights. I am also president of the Persian Field Neighborhood Association, and I also serve on the city's Historic Commission uh, Board. Okay, thank you, sir. We have three minutes for you. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, go back, and I am speaking for my neighborhood association, which covers a very large swath of the heights. And um, I just need to say that this project at 152 Ogden Avenue just does not fit the realm of what we have supported in the heights in the past. It's way too large. Um, you're putting it next to uh, a building that's on the state and, and national register of historic sites, which is 154 Ogden Avenue. Um, the chance of undermining that building uh, I think are significant. We don't want to lose any more of our historic resources. Uh, they are f way too important uh, to us as a city moving forward. Uh, this building does not fit into anything on Ogden Avenue or in the immediate area. We don't need an eight-story glass tower sticking up above all of the other homes and in a place where we'll, there will be no other like buildings. Uh, let's try and keep all those eight and 10 story buildings together, concentrated in the same area, and leave the low rise areas um, to low rise. And um, I appreciate everyone's efforts here tonight. And uh, I just want to say, please uh, think about uh, what this president will take, will, will, the president that this approval um, we'll, we'll start in the Heights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Yes, it's Megan McKee, M-E-G-H-A-N-M-C-K-E-E, -E -E, 469 Palisade Avenue. Good evening, ma'am. And I'm not a member. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We have three minutes for you. Uh, I just want to echo everything that's been said tonight. It is so dire that we do not have this built on a cliff, the palisade and everything. But I also want to stress that the same architect and developer that wants to create this has also tried to build something very close to this site, uh, right on New York Avenue. He knows our feelings about all of this, and he knows exactly what we've discussed many, many times in regards to what our neighborhood wants and what our community wants. And he knows what we feel. And it's just, it's disheartening to have to have this conversation over and over and over again. And it just feels like as a neighborhood, we're not being listened to, which I'm thankful that the RNA does represent us and does try to speak out for us. But I'm just very disheartened by this. Thank you. I do. Monica Plotka, Monica, M-O-N-I-C-A, P-L-O-T-K-A. I live at 373 Ogden. I've lived at 373 Ogden. Oh, let me say thank you for your service. Thank you. And <laughs> are you an RNA member? I'm not okay. currently. You should be. But I will be <laughs> again soon. <laughs> I'm delinquent. Anyway, um, I feel like... Wasn't there just a redo of the zoning in Jersey City? Didn't we just have a full exploration of it? I think I took a tour with you before you did it. 
And when I saw a flyer for this building, I was like shocked. How could this be? It's in the R1. But it's not, I realized. It's in a zone all its own, um, which I think is such a huge mistake that this happened. So I, I don't really understand how or why that it, it, we could change other things. Why did, why did this um, why did this happen? So it's completely out of character with that street, uh, well, our street. The other thing I, I've been thinking a lot about what people are saying today. I, I by maybe 20 minutes, uh, I could have died when all those rocks fell down on Patterson Plank Road, that storm in, I think it was 2007, when the underneath the Yardley building, that wall just collapsed. I drove by there. I remember the day so clearly. And I don't know. what That's Union City. It's not Jersey City. But it did happen. And I know the cliff is probably... I don't know. I don't know the state of the cliff. But um, I live at 373 across from those five row houses where the mayor once lived. He's since moved on. But during Ida and some of the storms, uh, there's five homes there that uh, the catch basins all filled up and the the water flew through the doorways going into their basement apartments and went out the other side. It was terrifying for these people. So we, because we're on a cliff doesn't mean that we're safe from flooding and catastrophic flooding. And these kind of storms keep happening more and more. I just think you have to think about all these issues that these experts we have here are, are bringing up. I'm not one of them. I just observed catastrophes <laughs> on our, our block where when I moved there from Hoboken, I was like, thank God, no more flooding. <laughs> but that's just not the case. We have a lot of issues. And the more and more development that comes, the more ground that's covered and has the water has nowhere to go. So... Just this past weekend, several of my neighbors reported bubbling up sewage in their homes. I'm lucky I didn't have it. I don't know, you know, I, but a, a lot of people right on our side of Ogden have been having these issues. So we just have to think about quality of life and safety. And this building is just way out of scale for our neighborhood, um, for that street, for that the zone that exists around it. I, I, I just can't, I urge you to vote no. We need a compromise. We need something better. We need to do better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Emily, E-M-I-L-Y, Duke, D-U-K-E, 329 Palisade. Good evening, ma'am. And are you a, uh, no. an RNA member? Okay, no. thank you. We have three minutes for you. Thank you. Good evening, board members. Um, I wanted to start by saying thank you for doing this important and difficult job. Um, to anyone in favor, I think if you think this building will mean there's more affordable housing on Ogden Avenue, you clearly did not look at the plans, and you'll be sorely mistaken. I'm worried about all the issues that were raised already, um, stormwater disturbing the cliff and the huge eight-story design looking absurd on Ogden Avenue. If you recall on the Zoom meeting where this case started, there were over 100 community members on um, ready to speak on their concerns. The fact that the meetings have been moved to in-person at 5.30 takes away the voice of many residents who cannot be here. It should be easier and not harder to participate to participate in things that affect our community. So taking that into consideration, the people who cannot be here, and thank you, Yousef, for speaking on their behalf, as well as everyone at RNA and who has spoken so far. Um, I just wanted to say um, that I implore you to listen to those people that you serve and uh, do the right thing to deny this application. Thank you. Good evening again. Good evening, and Ms. Burke, you've already been sworn in tonight and you were still under oath. And we have Wonderful. three minutes for you. Thank you. Um, the rock that's there is very strong, as the engineers for the applicant had attested to when they gave their testimony. But water is stronger. 
and the fissures that they referenced certainly can be affected by that water, but as many of the people here tonight who live in the area, they attested that that strong rock is actually what the water flows over and into their home and into the neighborhood. So it doesn't always just go over the cliff, but it can go into the surrounding neighborhood. And the fact that the JCMUA, which I checked the website, uh, the portal, I didn't see any um, report from the JCMUA about this project as of yet. And certainly it was supposed to be something that was presented before the application was even considered. And so I would really think that based on the fact that it's incomplete, you should deny this on the basis of that they really haven't presented is this a minor as they claim, or a major development. And from my looking at all the plans, I would say even if it were on the border, it given the fact that all this rock is underneath, you should be considering a major development here because it really does need to address the stormwater. Um, one other point I would like to make, and if all of you looked at the shade study that was presented in the plans, the shade that is cast on the surrounding neighborhood, because it is very much on the cliff, that it casts a shade, a shadow, all around itself. The morning sun rises in the east and to the north. It gives this incredible it looks like an entire block it's casting a shadow. So those are two things that really should have been taken more into consideration when it comes to the neighborhood. Because to lose that kind of, sh that kind of sunlight, particularly this time of year in the winter when the sun is lowest on the horizon, is when we need the sunlight the most. And Really, that's very, very impactful. And believe me, I know I live next to a very large building. I may appreciate it in the summer when it shades me from the heat of the sun, but I certainly don't appreciate it in the winter. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, Michael Falco, last name F A L C O, thirty six zero three Kennedy Boulevard. Uh, I don't know much R about. Are you an RNA member? No, I'm not. Okay, thank you. We're I don't know much about the cliffs. I'll be leaving with a lot more anxiety than I had coming here about <laughs> all the speculation. Uh, but what I do know is that the one nineteen is the worst bus in New Jersey that I've ever taken. Uh, it's like a poster child for New Jersey transit's incompetence, to be completely honest with you. And I don't know how we're going to fit people, if you're going to set a precedence of these multifamily massive buildings, uh, a lot of these people are young professionals that work in the city. And there's days when I miss like three buses because they're full. I have to explain it to my boss. It's ridiculous. And I really hope that that's taken into consideration with these projects going forward. Thank you. Anybody else, please come on up. Good evening. Yes, I do. Yes, my name is Reni, R-E-N-I. My last name is Stoll, S-T-O-L-L, -L, and my address is 21B Bleecker Street. Good evening, ma'am, and are Good you evening. an RNA member? No, I'm not. Okay. No, thank you so much, and I don't want to keep you um, any longer from your families and from your dinner. Okay. Uh, they, appreciate. She misses me. It's all right, but <laughs> appreciate we have three all your, for you. <laughs> appreciate all your work, and I don't want to be repeating everything that has been said. I agree with everything. I'm as well concerned about integrity of the cliff, um, maintaining the wildlife, and stormwater, sewage system, etc. Um, but I'm just thinking, you know, Ogden Avenue is one of the nicest streets in Jersey City Heights. And it really is a gift from the past to all of us because it has really beautiful buildings. It's a, it has a nice streetscape. And I'm just thinking, what are we leaving uh, for, the, for the future? 
what gifts are we leaving for the future for everybody who comes after us, right? Are we leaving something that's memorable, it's beautiful, it's sustainable? Um, so I, I just feel that we can do better, smarter, we can build smarter, better buildings, and really think also about integration within existing neighborhoods, because we can still bring new developments, but we can also build them the way that they can fit. Uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, we can learn a lot from old times. We can go back to Renaissance. We can go back to Victorian age. We can go back to um, modern times. But um, I just really feel that um, we, do not, we do not want to send a precedent of uh, buildings that completely are out of scale, out of proportion, out of balance within our neighborhood. And this building will be such. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Chair, I'd like to, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to cl uh, close the public portion. Second. Okay, motion is made and seconded. Public is closed. Uh, before we go on, Mr. Harrington, I don't see Mr. Lean here anymore. Do you have authorization to carry his next application on tonight? Uh, I do. <laughs> I do. I believe that's 385 Communipaw that 385, you're referring to? Yeah, 385 to 387 Communipaw. Yes, if we could carry that to, to the next uh, hearing date, if possible. Um, Cam, I didn't think we could make the next one possible. No, we would have to put it to March 19th. Okay, so we'll carry to a date certain March 19th. I know Mr. Lean was aware that it was the 19th. And uh, Okay, so we're going to carry case P22-129. It's a preliminary, preliminary and final major site plan for 385 to 387 Communipaw Ave to a date certain, March 19th, with preservation of notice. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council, do you want to give a closing statement, and I'll allow, allow Ms. Hagianis as well? Well, I, I thought that, uh, yeah, I thought Ms. Hagianis was going to go first. Okay. But um, That's fine. Come on if, up, Ms. If I could, before we go there, um, you know, in response to, uh, you know, the comments from the public comments, one, one thing I think, we, you know, we can add, which... Uh, uh, is, is a concern with the minor development versus the major development. Um, while the applicant, you know, does not concede or agree that it's a minor development for stormwater purposes under the uh, interpretation of the ordinance and, and our calculations, uh, and speaking with my client... Minor. I he, think you sent that, said that backwards. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Reverse, I don't, don't want to put that. words in your mouth. <laughs> think so, about it first. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, we're not conceding that, that, it's, a, that it's a major uh, development. Sorry for that, and thank you. Um, but uh, my my client uh, has advised me that he would agree uh, to to um, develop the property under the major development standards uh, under the stormwater ordinance. Mm -hmm. You know, as indicated at the last meeting, that that would mean that there would be a uh, a detention underground detention, uh, and that. The idea would be would be to put it under the building, um, uh, and that that can be designed, you know, accordingly. Uh, I have uh, also spoken with my experts here uh, tonight, and if the board would like to hear from them, you, can. But they've all confirmed that that would not change any of their analysis or analysis or calculations with regard to the foundation and 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 um, stability uh, of the rock. Uh, and and uh, the building that would be proposed, but that is something that we we are agreeing to. All right, thank you, Ms. Hadjianis. Do you want to make a statement? Mm -hmm. Good evening, commissioners, Good evening. and um, I just want to thank you for your time and attention, and you, especially you heard testimony from four different engineers, uh, which was probably pretty technical compared to a lot of the applications you hear. And um, I want to thank you for keeping an open mind because there are some unique issues that have come up on this application. Uh, and I did just want to briefly address what um, Mr. Harrington said about being will the applicant being willing to address or, or to treat this as if it's a, my, a major development for purposes of stormwater control. You don't have a plan in front of you that has a major stormwater uh, management system. The plans 
um, do not have any specificity in them. You heard testimony from the applicant's civil engineer, Mr. Liebeskind, that if they were going to do a stormwater system, they would have to excavate even further down into the bedrock that forms the Palisades. And um, that's a new cut and fill plan. So I think it would change a lot of the geotech. It would change the site plan. And I don't think you can vote on a plan you haven't seen. So I would, I would beseech you, please do not make this a condition of your approval. It really is something under our ordinance that has to be complied with at the outset, not as a post-approval uh, condition. Uh, so having said that, I'm, I'm just going to go back to the beginning of my summation. Um, so I'm representing Riverview Neighborhood Association. It is one of the oldest continuously running neighborhood associations in Jersey City. According to the, one of the commenters, it, it was first started in 1983. And it, since the RNE members aren't allowed to speak this evening, I did want to just briefly summarize why they care so much. They were instrumental in the passage of the Palisades Protection Overlay District, the special zone that protects the Palisades. They believe that this is an irreplaceable natural research, resource that is worthy of protection, and they want that ordinance strictly enforced. They've seen erosion along the Palisades in their backyards, and at least one collapse in backyards along abs uh, along Ogden they're also concerned about safety and stability of a new building like this that's being built so close to the cliff um, they're concerned of, like, like everybody else about stormwater and flooding you heard a lot of that um, and just any new development how it impacts the neighborhood and they've RNA has successfully partnered with the city in, in a lot of ways and um, and with the development community, and they have a vision for the neighborhood that has been, um, I think, in many ways, um, respected by the development community and by city planning. So what is the legal framework for the board's decision making? You, I think you've heard the term as of right, as of right, as of right, over and over and over again, um, which might lead you to believe the board has no authority to deny the site plan, but that is simply not the case. Uh, first, I want to um, say that it's, uh, and there are grounds in, in, it, in the land use treatise um, Cox and Koenig, which every land use lawyer uh, refers to, talks about the reasons uh, for that a, a planning board may deny us a site plan. Um, so zoning compliance is one reason. Here our stormwater control ordinance is part of our zoning ordinance. We've made the case, I believe, that this plan does not comply with the stormwater control ordinance, lack of specificity in the plans, missing information, misrepresentations in the plans, and safety. So those are some of the many grounds on, on which boards have been upheld when they've denied site plans in the case law. Uh, is this an as of right application, as you heard Mr. Lampy explain at the outset of our, our hearing in November, that very issue is the subject of a court case. Should a 30-foot should a setback have been required? Ultimately, we don't, we don't know. The, the case just started, and I'm, I'm not the lawyer on the case, so, but ultimately a variance may be required. So it's an open zoning compliance with that 30-foot setback requirement is still, as far as my client is concerned, an open question. Um, what information is missing? The, the board has not received anything from the JCMUA on the adequacy of the stormwater management plan from the JCMUA. Um, and I just wanted to read to you from our ordinance because it does in, it's a section 345-74, section 14. Um, it says, uh, the municipal board or official shall consult with the engineers of the JCMUA and be guided by them to determine if all the submittal requirements have been satisfied and to determine if the project meets the standards set forth in this section. Municipal approval may not be issued unless the requirements of this section are met. And I think that is the JCMUA, they're the experts on this, and I think the board does need to hear from them prior to making uh, a decision. And, I, and it, 
and as a as a practical matter, I think that's helpful, but as a legal matter, it's required under our ordinance. Um, we don't know if the JCMUA considers this major minor, but in his, you know, I think the applicant's saying they're not conceding, but in his rebut rebuttal testimony, Mr. Liebeskind acknowledged that the JCMUA may in fact consider this project to be a major development for the purpose of stormwater control, despite the position taken by the applicant that it's a minor development. If it's major, the site plan's going to change. More excavation of the Palisades may be required to install a stormwater detention basin, as Mr. Liebeskind also acknowledged. Um, so it's, it's, so not having any comment or review from the, or nothing from the JCMUA, it's problematic in two ways. We don't know if the plan is in compliance with the ordinance and missing essential information needed to evaluate the adequacy of the stormwater plan, um, or th there is information missing necessary to evaluate the adequacy of that plan. Our expert, Jeffrey Gohl, who's a, a, a geotechnical engineer, he testified about the plan. His project was that this, his opinion was that this project is a major development for purposes of stormwater control. He testified that the limit of disturbance shown in the applicant's plans was 10,519 feet. That pushes you over the threshold for uh, over the minor development threshold into the major category. He also testified that the um, regulated impervious surface plus the regulated motor vehicle surface was 7,650 square feet, in, um, including off-site disturbance. That pushes you, uh, the plan over the 5,000 square foot threshold or combined threshold uh, between major and minor also. So there are two separate ways this plan uh, gets into the major development category. Even without the site disturbance, Mr. Goal, uh, even without off-site disturbance, Mr. Goal testified that the regulated impervious surface and the regulated motor vehicle service surface was 6,000 square feet. So even if you eliminate the off-site parts of the plan, you're still over 5,000. Um, and it, and it, and I think it's I think it's beyond dispute. It's major, but. Just even thinking about it, just if you if you enjoy, you know, I know we have some doctors on the board and we have some people in the building trade. So just like from a from a quantitative reasoning perspective, if you just think about the size that's depicted on the plans, it's roughly 40 feet by 100 feet. That's 4,000 square feet. Just that the building itself is going to occupy the number. In Mr. Liebeskin's engineering report, what's the impervious surface? His number was 3,671. That's less than what the building's going to occupy. And he, he, said, and he said that he doesn't count the building. He backs that square footage out from his total. How can a building not be part of an impervious surface? Obviously, it's impervious. You don't get water soaking into the ground underneath a structure. Um, or, or this kind of building. Uh, so I think the position taken in that re report was just indefensible. Uh, um, then then our, our expert went on to talk about, is there even any kind of stormwater management plan? He said there are permeable pavers shown in the architect's drawings, but there is nothing in the civil engineering plans. There is no system depicted. There is a sort of a rendering of permeable pavers. And that, uh, so he said there really, what was shown wasn't a real stormwater management system in terms of materials or design. The design doesn't meet DEP regulations. You also can't tell where the water is supposed to be going once it sinks into the cracks between the pavers. Um, the pavers are also shown over 12 foot PSE and G easement. You can't, and according to our expert, you can't put a stormwater management system over um, a utility easement. Uh, the applicant's engineer also testified that the JCMUA adamantly opposes water infiltration into the ground. And that's what this applicant is proposing. So on the one hand, they have a stormwater system that doesn't meet DEP regulations and there's no details. On the other hand, it's also something that JCMUA won't 
won't like because it shows water kind of going in between the pavers. Uh, let's see. So I, I think just based upon the adequacy of the stormwater management plan or the inadequacy of that plan, there's enough reason to deny this application. Um, and, and I don't think it can be granted with, as, with a condition for something we haven't, a system we've, we have not seen. Uh, safety, there, w there was an issue of pedestrian safety that came up. There's an intersection at Wood Place and Ogden. Um, originally, according to the city engineer, the driveway was supposed to be moved at least 30 feet away from a crosswalk. Um, but then I, I guess they figured out they don't have 30 feet to move the, the driveway on uh, anywhere in that parcel. Um, so the driveway is now 4.1 feet away uh, from the crosswalk, as Mr. Liebeskin testified on my when I did my cross. Um, it's they decided the best way to do it is abutting another driveway, and I, and one of the public commenters really really um, s struck me. She she talked about having a vision impaired child who now has to cross two side by side driveways close to an intersection where there's no traffic control and. Um, you know, it does seem that there's there are still safety concerns, even if engineering has okayed the relocated driveway, and that maybe maybe it's possible no driveway would be better. Um, our engineer also said, okay, they did they did do their geotech report at our at our chairman's urging. He insisted on that back in November, to his credit. Um, but there there are still some concerns about erosion and slope stability. Uh, he he said that even though the applicant prepared a geotechnical report, he didn't include stormwater or um, seasonal, yeah, seasonal groundwater in his model. And as he said, water is a great lubricator. Um, he, he, and we don't really know the exact incline of the bedrock. One of the points he said was in, interpolated to show this slope in a cross section. So how, how is that water that's, that's, we're not sure where it's going, how's it going to lubricate the, the, between, the soil that's resting on the bedrock? He also talked about this wedge of overburden that's going to be in front of the building. Um, and once you excavate and you put a bigger, taller building there, it's gonna create additional pressure on that overburden. And that, that could be a potential source of slope failure. Um, so in, in conclusion, uh, this, this is an applicant that wanted and, and fought over community objection to locate the building as close to the edge as possible, came before the board in November without a geotech report that really met the t technical requirements, or, or actually in, yeah, in November, uh, without meeting the geotechnical requirements um, under the Peapod ordinance and was sort of forced to meet them, presented a plan that is very sketchy and I would submit incorrect on stormwater control. And the one place I would think you really want to manage stormwater well is at the edge of a steep slope. There are safety concerns there. I think it's really, really important that they get this right and not as some post-decision condition that the public can't even examine or 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 uh, see in the plans uh, until it's until the board you know until it's too late or after the fact so um and i and I, and if they are doing the major plan it's nice to hear that um but that means the site plan may significantly change and we we need to see that i think they would have to bring a renewed application um but I would just once again reiterate, I don't think it's possible to approve this application with a condition and, and would ask the board on behalf of RNA to deny the application. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hodgianis. Okay, thank you. Uh, the board, thank you for your time uh, on this application and everybody's uh, time and input. Um, as, as I started off uh, the application, and, and I know you've heard it before, and I'm going to say it again, it, uh, it is an as-of-right application. 
Um, it's an application uh, that complies with the R3 zoning standards and it complies with the, the PPOD standards, both the procedural regulations and the performance uh, standards. And, and I, I note too that, you know, someone from the public said there was recently a redo of, of the ordinance, right? There was a substantial changes. And uh, this was zoned R3 before then, it did not change. It stayed as R3. So while it's, you know, there's an R3 zone between the R1, that has been there for a very long time. Uh, and it's not just this property, there's the property, the parking lot uh, to the north, and then I believe that, that other building, uh, the condo building is in the R3. So um, we're not seeking, you know, any variances, we are following uh, the R3. Um, we're not seeking any more bulk uh, than what's permitted under the R3. And in fact, as presented to you, we're seeking less because the project is designed by pulling back the sixth and uh, the seventh and eighth floor. Um, and and you, if you recall, that's uh, the building is set back five feet from the, from the property line. And then there's an additional setback of 18 and a half feet on the seventh and eighth floor uh, to create that that that, uh, you know, the setback look, as this board knows, you, you, you create that to, to, so that a, a project reads a little bit smaller uh, at, the, at the ground level, um, on the sidewalk level. So while you have a compliant building, uh, the applicant has, has designed a building that, is, that uh, creates a, a lower scale building from, from the streetscape. So um, it's a little different uh, application before the board because the, the Peapod standards, they are part of the application before you. And, and I think it's fair to say that this board has seen more technical data and analysis than any other site plan uh, you've seen before it. A lot of this data and analysis is something that, that is post-approval. Um, it's part of a building permitting process that you would work through with the construction department, with the MUA, uh, with, with the JC uh, engineering department, but that um, that's not the case here. We have provided you that information. Um, we believe that all the information that, that you have been provided uh, absolutely meets the requirements of the PPOD, uh, the procedural uh, regulations, um, as well as uh, well, all, all the procedural reg regulations and then the, the standards uh, on the setbacks. Um, and I think, I think what, you know, the intent, you know, because I was, I was around too when, when they were doing the Peapod, you know, 20 plus years ago. I remember uh, having meetings on uh, the project at the base of the cliff, where I believe Cliff Steinberg was the, uh, no pun intended, I believe he was the, one of the leaders uh, of, of the RNA at the time. And, and I believe the, the intent of providing this data and analysis to this board as part of an application is, is to demonstrate that the, pro the project can be built, that it's not going to affect the integrity of the cliff. You're going to be set back far enough from a, a cliff face and, and the steep slopes that, that, uh, that uh, run uh, uh, adjacent to, to any cliff face. And, and I think I think we've done that, and and I, I think what you've heard uh, from from the objectors, you know, they have concerns. We we understand that, and I they're all le legitimate concerns. But uh, we believe that we've we've met all the requirements uh, to provide this board um, to and any information to make a determination that this this is a, a uh, would be a safe uh, project. And I think some of the information that you heard from the objectors. And, and their expert uh, is information that's beyond the requirements of the Peapod. Um, they, you know, the, when you look at the the procedural regulations, they have it's a little amorphous uh, to begin with. It, it talks about you know giving me information such as a technical summary, such as it's not it's not definitive as to what is required to be before this board. Um, the the objectors expert, you know, they. They, they testified as to, well, you don't have this, you don't have that, but it's beyond what's stated in the Peapod. Um, we're, we're not required to have that. And notwithstanding that, we, we believe we've had, we had a structural engineer and a geotechnical engineer present to this board, um, both of which have extensive experience in other projects in Jersey City on, on uh, projects with bedrock uh, and you know, similar issues. 
they testified before this board that they see they have no no issues with, with putting this building here. They they looked at the load capacity, they looked at the stability of the rock, and and they said it's okay. Uh, I mean, with all due respect, we can say what if, what if, what if, um, you know, tragedies happen, and I'm not belittling, or, you know, uh, that, but um, we have our experts saying this this works, um, and you know the. With all due respect to the to the applicants, uh, I mean the objectors uh, expert, uh, you know he asked questions. You may want to look at this. We didn't have that, but he didn't provide any report or or written analysis back to this board for you to consider. Um, so there really isn't anything, in my opinion, that refutes our experts' opinion that this can be done. Um, and you know I think that that speaks to the safety of the project too. Uh, I know there's concerns for safety. There's all you know, all kinds of regulations that that uh, the applicant would need to follow as part of any construction of this project, um, and and I note that you know the driveway uh, uh, location that was reviewed by the Jersey City Traffic and Engineering Department and approved. So you know I would defer to them as to whether or not they believe that is a, a safe condition. Yeah, we believe it is. Um, and I think lastly, too, uh, I want to touch upon, you know, there's been some comments about whether it it's, doesn't fit in with the, with the neighborhood. And I guess, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, but we are complying, you know, with the, the uh, R3 standards. Um, but I also note, as the architect said, he did consider the design standards when he designed this. It does have a setback on the seventh and eighth floor. The sixth floor uh, reaches uh, about 65 feet. Uh, the building to the north, um, I heard one one public uh, comment was that it's about 50 feet. So you're looking at a you know a 65 versus 50 feet uh, overlooking the Palisades. Um, I don't think that that's that's a large difference uh, when you're you're talking about a scale of a building. The architect also testified that they used um, certain materials um, and finishes and setbacks and design features to, to fit in with the, the neighborhood and the community. So I believe, again, people may not like a design. We've all seen that. You know, I'm sure there's designs that come before you that don't, you don't typically care for. But uh, we believe that we comply uh, with, with the, um, the design standards. Uh, and, and, you know, I think can't lose sight too, that you're, you're going to, the proposal is to remove, uh, a surface parking lot that has been there, uh, forever. Surface parking lots are the worst lane use in, in, uh, in the city. We actually have a parking lot to the north and then a driveway and parking lot to the south as well. The proposal is to, f to sit between those two. So you're still going to have substantial light and air. Uh, between the, the the adjacent properties, um, so that uh, and and also the the building is not taking up the entire lot. Uh, it's it's uh, you know conceded we have a PSE uh, and G easement that we have to contend with, but that that means that this this uh, development like the zoning I don't believe is 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 uh, created with the understanding that there may or may not be an easement. The zoning was created that you could possibly have have a, a bigger building across the whole. A lot here. That's not the case. It's a reduced uh, project in and of itself because of that easement. So that leads or lends to the supporting that that it is consistent with the design criteria. Um, lastly, I think you know with regard to the stormwater, I think uh, you know as, as I said earlier, we would uh, agree. The applicant would agree to have the stormwater consistent with uh, a major development. Um, I believe that that can be a condition of, of an approval. Uh, that is something typically in, in applications where every standard condition, you know, you're gonna comply or address the, the uh, Jersey City review comments. So what that means is you're gonna, you're gonna leave uh, the planning board and you're gonna go to the MUA and they're gonna have to approve, review and approve what, what your, your plan is. If they don't approve it, then, then you gotta rework it. But I definitely think that's something that this board can can approve as a condition of approval. It's not going to result in 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 further ex excavation below what's already proposed. 
Um, it's something that would be below the building. Um, it's not going to be on, on top of the PSE&G uh, um, uh, easement. And um, that, I think, I don't know how else to solve or address uh, the stormwater issues raised other than agreeing to comply with the, the uh, major development stormwater regulations. So we think, you know, contrary to the comments here, and, and you know, we've worked with a lot of these a lot of people in, in the public, and we, you know, respect their comments. And uh, and, and uh, you know, Anthony and I have gone to many, many, you know, community meetings. But we really think this is this is a terrific project. We think it fits in uh, with the zoning, and we've complied and, and provided this board uh, the the required data and analysis to to make a decision on it. And we we hope that uh, you agree and approve it. Thank you, Council. Matt, I'll turn to you. Comments? Staff comments? Anything? Sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. All right. So uh, we were in receipt of uh, a revised uh, engineering memo dated January 23rd, 2024, um, as, well as, uh, as well as a staff memo, which was drafted and dated um, September 12th, 2023. Uh, this application is in the R3 and Preservation, Palisades Preservation Overlay District. Uh, in this zone, uh, speaking first to R3, uh, this is a, a mid-rise zone. Um, it is meant to uh, fit a lot of different contexts. Uh, there are townhouses allowed in the R3 zone on smaller lots. On larger lots, there are mid-rise apartment buildings to all the way up to eight-story buildings. Um, when you think of an R3, uh, the Duncan Avenue is what comes to mind. Uh, that is in the historic district, but it's also zoned R3. Um, so large buildings on large lots uh, with uh, a significant amount of lot coverage. Um, and in the zoning that was drafted for R3, um, we made certain accommodations uh, for development re requests, which are mainly the car. Uh, so in the R3, we allow for 100% lot coverage. Um, this project is only uh, pr proposing 15%. Uh, they have an unusual lot, obviously. Uh, and they are in the Palisade Preservation Overlay District, right? So there's uh, certain performance and design requirements that, that are required of them. Um, they are meeting those. Uh, they do not have variances, this project. Um, they are, uh, one, to address some comments about safety in the engineering comments that we received. Uh, the engineer for the city recommended the, the location of the, the curb cut. Um, regarding the, the overlay district standards, uh, they are setting back from, uh, the, the cliff, uh, 63 feet uh, and change to the garage and, uh, 50, just about 51 feet, uh, to their residential above. Um, they are setting back more than 10 feet, which is what, what is required of them for a slope of greater than 30%, um, but they are doing 11 feet, 0.2. Um, so they're meeting the standards of the, the preservation, uh, Palisade Preservation Overlay District. This project is 14 units, it's eight stories. It's 14 uh, parking spots. Uh, in our staff memo, we recommended uh, staff conditions. Uh, we want to know if the applicant has reviewed those and uh, if they can put on the record if they would comply with those uh, conditions. Uh, yes, the applicant would comply. Uh, another uh, piece of the municipal code, which wasn't brought up, um, but I think is relevant here, is um, for major site plans, uh, we have uh, what's called review agents. Um, that's what it's called colloquially. 
Um, but the, the standard is 345-24B. Uh, and in that uh, clause, it specifies that uh, review agents, in this case being the engineering department uh, division, um, traffic transportation, and JCMUA, uh, have 14 days upon receipt to give us the comments. And that is not because, um, that is not an arbitrary number, it is is meant to fit into uh, the state statute in the MLU for time of decision. We are bound when we get a complete application to hear an application and decide, okay? 14 days have far elapsed. We have not gotten comments from the JCMUA. Uh, we have received two sets of comments from the Division of Engineering. Um, we frankly don't have any comments to go off of. Uh, that said, um, in our review, there are no variances on this application. If you have questions for staff, we are here for you. Okay, thank you, Matt. So I, I think the best way for us to go forward is uh, do some board deliberation. This is uh, it's possibly the most democratic thing everybody will ever see. We just have an open discussion between board members in public view. Um, if there's any concerns, bring them up. Let's talk about them, but this is a discussion for the board. This is not for cross-examination. This is between the board members. If we want to call anybody up, we can at this point. So anything? You sound like you want to say something. <laughs> Here to answer any of your questions, Chairman. I've seen you at a loss for words. Um, so here's, here's where I'm at. The applicant is saying that they'll comply with major stormwater regulations. No one on this board is an engineer. No one designs stormwater retention systems. What we always do is we rely on the MUA to provide those engineering requirements and the applicants will follow them. I have full faith in the MUA that, you know, when they get around to it, they'll make those calculations. And, you know, those calculations come in front of us all the time. I, and I'll be honest, you know, I, I've spent over 20 years of my life as a pipe fitter, and I don't understand the MUA's calculations. So, you know, Eddie, you might know a little more than me, um, but, you know, those are the experts we rely on to make sure that an ap applicant complies with, with the regulations. Um, so I'm comfortable putting it in the hands of the MUA to make sure that this site complies with the major stormwater requirement. That being said, I think if this requires digging into the bedrock, and Mr. Harrington's testimony stated that, you know, they believe that they don't have to dig into bedrock. I, I think if any of that has to occur, any digging into bedrock to make a stormwater retention system work, I think this is a completely different application. And they would have to come back. And I think they would have to come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and he said that on record. Yeah, I, I think that that's a significant change in the application process. And I think that would trigger them to come back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Santo, Matt, I'll, I'll trust you guys to, to have input here if, if you think that triggers it. So, Chairman, if the board is considering conditioning it on the determination that it is a, let me say it this way, 
the board has determined or determines that the applicant who has consented to is going to design the stormwater management system as a major development under the stormwater management ordinance. And that system requires the excavating of bedrock. Then it is determined to be a substantially different application by the board and the applicant would then have to come back to the board uh, for relief or for a amended or new application as a result of of that condition I think it could be dictated that way by the board in its memorializing resolution if that is what the pleasure of the board would be and the way the board wanted to to move forward with respect to that specific issue thank you Santa yeah I, I think any digging a bedrock would be a, a substantial change um, once again you know I, I trust the MUA's design standards um, that's what we rely on all the time and I, I think we'll do that again if you know if it was up to me um, anybody else I don't want to be the only person speaking on this it's not well, my board um, it's our board Chairman Eckstein um, what was presented meeting after meeting to us at this board um, I understand if they want to um, which would be a good thing decide to go with a water retention system um, to upgrade it, the project in that sense that's, a, that's always a good thing right but as of right now, what's been presented to me in this, in their um, testimony to us was that uh, what they're presenting now still works. I don't disagree. Um, and and, and it, it works. Um, I think we also, in that concept, um, even with the engineering, the engineer, if he's here, uh, the bedrock, basically, there's a lot of talk of the building sliding and not being safe. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk about that. The water's going to take the building and slide and not being safe. But there's bedrock in a lot of places in Jersey City. Yeah. And I haven't seen buildings sliding and moving in Jersey City because we got a 100-year storm. They didn't float. They didn't move. Academy Street, anything built around Academy Street is built on bedrock. Mm -hmm. And those builders stay still when we had the 100, when we got Sandy, my aunt lived on Academy Street. That house is still right there, same spot. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is, um, to the board, is that the safety aspect of things just floating and moving and, and stuff like that, uh, a question I would ask the engineer right now is basically, you know, um, my concern would be, and I'm surprised that, I'm, I'm sorry to see Mr. Williams, uh, Mr. Cologne, and the other neighbor leave, because I think a message that maybe I'm going to start bringing forth to all homeowners in Jersey City, when somebody's built a site in your neighborhood, Always check your home. I work construction all my life. And like I mentioned earlier today for a different project, a very good developer from Jersey City had to buy two houses because somebody took the foot out of, out of them for a project his, his excavators were doing. Yeah. So if... Um, Sort of added, upgraded the water retention system 
Does it mean going into the bet lock? Are we clear from the test? I feel clear for the testimony. And if an like, engineer wants to come up and tell me again, what stops a building from shifting because of the rain that comes in? Another storm. We're going to condition like that. that, I think. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, so you're okay with the condition? I'm okay. Well, I'm, see, the way the condition sounds to me is that we're going to put this condition now. And if they do their calculations, they got to come back to us again because they might have to go two feet into the bedrock. I'm not okay with that. That I'm not okay with. I think the bedrock is not going to shift the building. And I think that we should, uh, I, I think that they um, said that they could make this work without going into the bedrock. Then try to make it work. Give them the option of doing it both. They presented it to us. I mean. I, I'm giving them the option that they're saying they can make work. Right. Listen, I, what, I, they, I, what they're willing to do is great. They were to give us a better project. Yeah. That's what I think. And my experience in the pipe trades too. Yeah, I'm not a I'm not an engineer. Yeah. But you're gonna give me something better. It sounds good. I agree with both of you. Um, most important thing, my concern is the stormwater situation. Yeah. Um, we haven't heard from uh, MUA. I definitely would want to hear from them. I don't know, Council, if you could put some pressure on. I'm sure, I know there's a lot of things that have come up recently, emergency jobs and what have it. It could have been side and whatever on, on getting that stuff happening, uh, getting that completed. But I think uh, we really need to, I want to, I definitely want to hear about the stormwater situation. I don't feel rock is going to slide, but here again, I'm not an engineer. What heavy construction experience I've had, I, I don't really see anything for it, but I don't have a seal. You know, I can't take, I can't take that, uh, yeah. that well, make that decision. Well, that's, see, I'm, yeah. I'm not saying, oh, sorry, Chris. No, that's right. Um, you know, we don't claim to be experts. No. We, we rely on expert testimony. And believe me, we've had plenty of it here. We've had more than we've ever had on, on geotechnical terms. Believe it, I, um, I've read it. And, uh, you know you could have just watched the video, right? You didn't have to read it. I did that. Too. Okay. <laughs> did both. I didn't miss anything. Um, I guess I could give you a decision tonight, but here again, I, um, I'm surprised that the MUA have, hasn't responded. It, it's not out of the ordinary yeah. that the MUA doesn't respond. And again, we rely on the MUA's expertise, and we always have the applicant say that they'll comply with the MUA reports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Chairman, let's, let's not mix apples and oranges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The MUA has to review the proposed stormwater management of any application that involves stormwater management. Yeah. So they would be the agency that would tell us and everybody else, the applicant, whoever, this works, this doesn't work. So if the MUA had put together a letter that said on application A, we reviewed what was proposed by the applicant, we are satisfied that this satisfies the requirements of the ordinance, it meets the code, and the calculations mathematically check out. We accept that as the planning board that the MUA has done what they're supposed to do and that their representation to mm -hmm. this board and to everybody else is accurate. So I think the only difference in this scenario that the chairman was adding to the potential approval would be, well, since you haven't actually gone and designed 
a stormwater management system for a major development under the stormwater management ordinance, when you design that, if it requires you to hit bedrock, then you've got to come back to this board. That's the only string attached to what the chairman was articulating. And if I understood Commissioner Torres's comment, it was, even if you hit bedrock, if the MUA says it's okay, I don't think you have to come back here. I'm okay with relying on the MUA, is what Commissioner Torres articulated, in my opinion. Very good point. Very so, good point. and make no mistake that if the MUA comes back and says, you know, you guys are out of your minds over designing this to, to meet a major stormwater management plan, they're still going to do it in my eyes. They're still going to yes. provide storm. That ship has attention. sailed. So even if the MUA says, well, you could have done this as a minor because we think it is a minor, right. the applicant has already agreed, although Mr. Harrington did a great job of trying to preserve that he wasn't uh, stipulating to that, but the board's going to make that decision for Mr. Harrington. Exactly. So he doesn't have to, mm -hmm. and he's going to design it to a major development requirement and criteria. The only open question in that regard, based on the comments of the board is, well, if you hit bedrock, do you have to come back to the board or not? And it sounds like Commissioner Torres is not in favor of that. Well, um, thank you for clearing that up too, though. The, uh, some of your points there, uh, it clears it up for me in a different way. Uh, and I do agree. The MUA has the final say. They're going to let us know. So whatever happens tonight on this project, whatever which way it goes, um, if it does pass, then um, they're going to let us know whether, hey, you guys can't build that or you guys can't do this, right? Then it has to come back. So if that's the case, then, then um, but you all could correct with what I was trying to articulate, but at the same time, I would... Um, um, also be comfortable if uh, it moves forward, just like last it was saying. It, 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 would, it wouldn't, um, it still has to, main thing, points. Whatever the MUA say, it's going to say because it's just like the engineers. It's going to be said and it's going to be done because it's safe. They're the experts. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. That's where I'll be comfortable. When I know that if they gave, because the project's not going to get built till they give us a study anyway. You know, so the holdup's going to be them giving you a study. And the truth of the matter is, whatever it is, yeah. whatever happens, it's not going to happen unless they have that study. Yeah. Well, this so is, I'm, I'm comfortable now with uh, which either way that it goes. You know, this is why when we don't have the MUA's numbers, we condition it that the applicant yeah. will follow the MUA's numbers. Yeah. And it's never had to come back to us. Okay. This could be the one, I, I don't know. Not. And again, if the MUA comes back and says, no, you only have to do minimum, you know. Okay. The, 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 the minor storm. That's clear. Land, no, it's, we want major. They've offered it, we want major now. Um, Right, designed to the major development standard. Anybody else? No, no sir. Uh, me and Eddie be the guys that talk too much. Anybody <laughs> else? Come on. <laughs> Jesus, that's <just> right. <laughs> Sorry if I confused you. <laughs> okay, so. so I'd, like to, I'd love the, uh, the clarity. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. So, personally, I would be comfortable going ahead with the condition that they design for a major stormwater management plan. And, Closer to the mic. and whatever calculations the MUA says they need to make that happen, they make happen. Um, 
and if they if they have to demo any bedrock or dig into bedrock or <coughs> you know dynamite bedrock is out of the question uh, without them coming back. Uh, I'm comfortable going forward with those conditions. Uh, I'll second that. Anybody else? You know, there's an open forum. Agreed. Um, Agreed. Agreed. Okay. I think then I'd entertain a motion if somebody wants to make one. Yes, I do. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve case P22-140 with the condition that uh, the, the applicant go with a design, uh, a major storm uh, water plan. A major development major storm water management. Uh, yes. And there's also the conditions that they agree Correct. to on this. Comply the, with the conditions set forth staff. Comments. And the condition regarding the excavation bedrock. into bedrock Correct. and jurisdiction being retained by the board in that event. Correct. Second. Okay, motion made and seconded for approval with those conditions. Vice Chair, Dr. Gonzalez. So I'm I, uh, going to talk a little bit because there are a couple of things I think that need to be said, and these two can, cannot be the only ones talking. Um, you know, I, so I, I want to speak to the public, I think, first, because I know that you guys, you know, we, like, like us, have been here. It has become harder to attend these meetings now that you have to do, you know, in person and it's not virtual. Um, but I and I, I I want you guys to know I'm a physician in the, in, the, in in Jersey City, um, and I serve the public uh, of Jersey City and New York City, and I and I'm very humbled and privileged to be able to do that. So usually I'm the I'm the um, the public guy, right? The, I I I totally understood and heard what each and every one of you said because we all live here. I mean, every single one of us live here. Um, and none of us are engineers, but what we, we have to go to, through uh, to, to get our final analysis needs to sometimes be said. And I know you guys will understand that. I know you understand that because I heard a couple comments of, well, the, you know, just because they said as of right. But I, I do want you to know that I am very appreciative of you coming here and that I, I, I really understand what you guys were saying and we hear you. We do, we, we actually do take all these into consideration. At the end of the day, um, we're tasked with, uh, and I've been on the board now, we were just calculating, uh, Eddie and I, uh, 12 years. And um, it's hard every time that there is such an opposition to a project like this, because it's very rare that that happens. We love it when everyone, uh, well, people don't come out for projects usually, uh, but we love it when, you know, uh, we just believe in good neighbors and good developers. And, you know, we don't, I don't know the developer in this case, but I will tell you the things that we can't consider really uh, when we're looking at a decision. One is how beautiful the building looks. We, we can kind of look at design standards, but not much. And we can't really look at how it fits with the community um, the obstruction of a view, um, the effect of migration of birds, those things we really can't look at. Uh, what we can look at is testimony, take into consideration testimony given by experts, in this case, two experts. Does it meet the goals and objectives of the master plan? In this case, it did. Does it meet the intent of the R3 and comply with R3 standards? It did. Um, are there any variances? There are not. Um, it's as of right. It goes further and meets the PPOT standards and requirements in both procedural and standard uh, guidelines. So those are the things that we have to look at, unfortunately. And in this case, they were all met. And at the end of the day, you know, we look at testimony from the experts, and one case had stronger testimony than the other. And... Um, with all that being said, um, I'm going to vote aye. Uh, the changing from the minor to the major was major for me, to be honest with you. Uh, because even though I just told you what we would have, I would have voted on, and people can vote however they want, um, that says a lot about where we, that was my main concern. That really was my main concern. If this was going to be a, 
designated as a major or minor. And so now that that has been shifted and changed and we've conditioned it, the other thing that we do at the very end is we rely on our on our expert uh, planning staff. And, you know, I, like I said, I've been here a long time. This is the best planning staff, I think, in the country. Um, and when they say and recommend the project to be approved, then we kind of listen. So I'm going to vote Commissioner Gangadon. So I don't want to be that long, Dr. Gonzalez. <laughs> <laughs> um, having sit through this project from since November and then back in January, um, we had a lot of history um, from the neighborhood as well. And I want to thank NRA and the community for your concerns, your attendance, and your comments um, throughout these meetings. Your comments definitely send the right um, message, which is accountability to both the developer, the builder, the um, expertise that will be on this project hands-on to be careful and to be cautious if this project is approved. So your, your concerns are valid concerns and we hear them and I'm sure that you'll work hand-in-hand -hand with the developer as well as this project goes along. But based on the master plan and the redevelopment plan, this project meets the goals and objectives. There are no variances, and as such, it's a right-of-way project. What happened here to this evening in, re in redesign of the major stormwater plan is a major win for everyone here this evening, for the community, and for us as uh, commissioners as well. We rely on the testimony of the expertise, and with that being said, I will vote aye. Commissioner Torres. So just want to take a, an extra minute of your time. We've been coming to this one. Your mic is not on. Just want to also take an extra minute of your time and make a couple comments. We've been doing this project um, longer than any other project I think I've seen in a while. Um, never had one project be the only project we did in one day uh, in that many hours and still have to come back. Uh, so, um, to the community, um, I, I'm impressed with the years I've been on this board and different communities. I mean, I thought Hamilton Park and Van Force Park and Paulus Hook had their experience and stuff, but you guys really are like top league. You know, your, your experience, your history, um... Kind of surprised me. I'm a downtown boy. Yeah, I mean, I live in Greenville now, but I'm still a downtown guy. And um, you um, have a lot of experience. So with that, I don't want to offend nobody, but there's a master plan. There's a redevelopment plan. There was somebody that came last meeting it's, uh, two meetings ago it spoke that he worked on the plan with uh, Rob, Robert Carter on the plan up in Palisades and in that area and he spoke very elegant very knowledgeable but we just went over the master plan last year we just went over the redevelopment plan and that's when that stuff needed to be changed. You got my hands tied. And it's, and it's frustrating, you know, um, that you, we come to this board, a group that's so experienced, and we're dealing with something that this, you got our hands tied. And believe you me, uh, if you look at my history, I voted on projects that I should, was supposed to say yes and I didn't agree with. So I, I did have that history. But in this case, um, there's a project in Jersey City by a church that I grew up in, and one building is different than the other. This is what happens when they start changing neighborhoods. Some buildings start to look different. Maybe 100 years from now, they're going to say this building is a good, beautiful building. I don't know, you know. Um, 
but when we have development, things start to change. Um, I did have other notes. I got off track a little bit, so right now I'm going to just give you my vote. And uh, Please, if you come out and figure out a way how to change the plan for the rest of the neighborhood. That's where, that's where you get it to go. How did you change it? That this board doesn't have to be put in this position. And with that, I, as of right project, an R3, no variances, um, I'm voting I. Oh, and another thing I really want to say. Everybody, and they're going to build it safe. And they're going to build this safe. The build is... Is going to be built with by the experts on bedrock the safest way possible. That's what the other departments in Jersey City are going to make sure happens. That's what they do. So with that, I vote aye. Commissioner Stamato? I vote aye. Commissioner Cruz? I vote aye. Commissioner Dr. Desai? Uh, the main problem was stormwater control, which has to be dealt with, and also um, Palisades Cliff and safety. And so many people came here tonight with uh, Sam Pessin and uh, our councilman. Uh, and all of you, you had all your pro uh, all your opinions. So we would like to thank you. We would like to thank you for coming over here, but with these two problems, if uh, the uh, it's already changed from minor to major uh, uh, site plan uh, with uh, stormwater control, then uh, those two are deal. Then I'll vote I. Chairman Langston. So I, I'm not going to reinvent anything here. I think everybody's spoken their minds um it, it complies with the r3 zone do i love eight stories i don't know it complies with the r3 zone um that's that's the oath that i took was to uphold the zoning in this city that's the zoning and i i you know everybody else said it and I talk about it all the time. If you see an empty lot next to you, something's going to go there. Something is going to go there. Um, you know, my councilman came down and spoke tonight. I had a conversation with him last week that, you know, why do these things get to the point where the community has to come down and oppose an as of right project? Does the councilman's office have a list of empty lots that they could check what the zoning is on those empty lots and maybe get out ahead of it before an applicant buys a lot with the understanding of what this can be, what can be built on that lot? And that's what they want to build. That's their investment. Make no mistake, you know, everybody hates to have a greedy developer move in next door, they're in business. That's development is a business. So, you know, before it gets to us as of right, look at the zoning. Get the zoning changed if you oppose. Kern, I, I love that you guys come down. We listen to a lot. This is, this is our time. All right. I, I appreciate it. Um, so, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to walk out of here tonight. RNA is going to think they lost this. I tell you what, Harrington doesn't give up that, that stormwater, changing it to a major without you people coming out tonight. So you made a difference tonight. You got that major designation. You got the stormwater retention. That that's a win in my book for for the heights. Um, again, it's it's a 
an as of right project as far as site plan goes. So I want to thank you guys for coming down. Eddie said it best, you know, we, we've seen a lot of community groups over the years that come and go. RNA is always here. RNA is, is a tough group and, and we appreciate that. Um, you know, anybody that, that's going to keep Harrington honest on this thing, I, I love it. Um, so, you know, my vote is I, um, and, and council, the, the applicant's still in the room, I see. This is my neighborhood. Um, we're going to make sure this thing is built safe. It's not a far walk from my apartment. So I'm going to keep an eye. And uh, that's it. Thank you, everybody. Motion carries all in favor uh, with, on a motion to approve with conditions. Okay, let's move on to memorialization of resolutions. Sure, Chair, we have uh, eight resolutions, I believe, Kim. Yeah, okay, Kim. Mike, do you want to <laughs> come up here? It's going to be loud for you. No. Did you, uh, Cam, did you give me Liberty Harbor North on the resolutions? Whatever's there. It's just those eight. You don't see it? I thought I saw it. You and I didn't go through them, sorry. I thought I saw it. Where is it? Liberty Harbor North. Number six. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion. To memorialize the following resolutions. Resolution number one of the Planning Board of the City of Jersey City is applicant Backpack Boys JC LLC for conditional use 746 Grand Street, Jersey City, New Jersey, block 18703, lot 9, case number P23-039. Second resolution of the Planning Board of the City of Jersey City applicant is Hudson Exchange Embankment Plaza LLC for preliminary and final major subdivision at 145 Ganjemi Drive, 36 Second Street, and 125 Provo Street, Jersey City, New Jersey, Block 11603, Lots 2, as subdivided, New Lot 2.01, and New Lot 2.02, 47.02, uh, as subdivided, New Lot 47.03 and 47.04, and 51.02 to be consolidated with a new lot 2.01, case number P2023-0030. Third resolution of the Planning Board of the City of Jersey City, applicant Hudson Exchange Phase 2, LLC, for preliminary and final major site plan amendment with C deviation, variance 99 Provost Street, formerly 400 to 420 Marin Boulevard, Jersey City, New Jersey, block 11603, lot 51.01, Formerly lots 50 and 51, case number P2023-0031. Fourth resolution of the Planning Board of the City of Jersey City. Applicant is Hudson Exchange and Magnet Plaza LLC for preliminary and final major site plan at 145 Ganjemi Drive, Jersey City, New Jersey, Block 11603, Lot 2 as subdivided, New Lot 2.02, case number P2023-0032. Fifth resolution of the Planning Board of the City of Jersey City, applicant Hudson Exchange and Bankman Plaza, LLC, for preliminary and final major site plan, 145 Ganjemi Drive, Jersey City, New Jersey, Block 11603, Lot 2, as subdivided, new Lot 2.01, and consolidated with Lots 51.02, case number P2023-0033. Sixth resolution of the Planning Board of the City of Jersey City is finding the proposed amendments to the Liberty Harbor North redevelopment plan that are consistent with the City of Jersey City Master Plan and recommending to the Municipal Council of the City of Jersey City that said amendment be adopted with revisions. Seventh resolution of the Planning Board of the City of Jersey City is P2, case number P2023-0040 for site plan amendment, applicant 319 Fifth Street, LLC, address 319 Fifth Street, Jersey City, New Jersey, block 11208, lot 13. And the final uh, resolution, be on guard, is resolution of the Planning Board of the City of Jersey City for approval and recommendation of the adoption of Block 11606 Redevelopment Plan and an amendment to the Paulus Hook Redevelopment Plan, case number P2023-0036. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Cam, can we have a roll call, please, for resolutions? Vice Chair Dr. Gonzalez. Aye. Commissioner Gongadin. Aye. Commissioner yes. Torres. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Dr. Desai. Commissioner Cruz. Aye. 
Commissioner Stamato. Aye. And Chairman Langston. Motion carries. All in favor to memorialize resolutions. Executive session? No. No. Yeah, he said yes. Yeah, we're going to kill you. Mr. Chair, I move to uh, adjourn. Okay, do I have second. a second? All right, thank you guys. All yeses on adjourning, and let's get the hell out of here. Oh my gosh. What do you mean? Somebody lied to him. Why are you coming out now? Anybody want to come out? We're going to go to.